Good. For the record, Randy Lavy, good morning and welcome. Uh, for those that were birding this morning, good afternoon and welcome. <laughs> We're going to um, start off, the board can uh, pull to tab J, the Oregon Agricultural Heritage Program update with um, Eric Williams and two board members presenting. So for the record, Maida Lofsgarden, um, Eric and I will just give a very, very quick um, uh, background. Um, I'll start with just a reminder about the commission and then Eric's gonna talk about um, the rulemaking we've done, um, which is under agenda item J. And we will be brief because we'd really like to turn it over to um, board members, um, Will Newhauser and Laura Masterson, who have um, been your eyes and ears on the ground for this uh, program. So. Um, just a reminder, the, the commission um, was approved by the legislature during the 2017 session and at the January board meeting, you all approved the commission members on, I think it was January 31st and their first meeting was February 1st. Um, and they have absolutely hit the ground running. Again, I'll let um, Laura and Will uh, talk about details. Um, but we are currently, I, it'll be tight. Um, but we are on track, I think, right now for the rulemaking. So I'll turn it over to Eric, and he can just mention briefly the rules that we're working on. And then, Will and Lori, you can take it from there. For the record, Eric Williams with OWEB. Uh, Co-chairs, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the Ag Heritage Program because it's a really exciting opportunity for us. Um, you have uh, appointed a wonderful uh, commission. Uh, we've been working with them, as Maida said, since uh, February on a fairly rapid schedule, meeting every three to four weeks. Um, and what's exciting about it is it's an opportunity to start a program from scratch. And what that means is we have a commission who is actively working each meeting, um, developing language for these rules that, that we're coming up with um, for the topics that are listed in your um, in your staff report. Uh, we started with succession planning grants. Uh, obviously that's a topic on uh, a lot of folks' minds uh, as we think toward the future long term uh, with um, the median age of, of uh, farmers and ranchers um, getting older. Uh, right, Gary? <laughs> We're not getting any younger. Um, and it's a topic that um, that is is really critical to the to long-term success of uh, finding a way to protect working lands. And so we'll have rules around succession planning grants um, that will help provide uh, the technical assistance that uh, landowners need uh, and the technical information that they need to make sound decisions on succession planning. Uh, we're also working on rules for conservation management plans. And the conservation management plans um, can focus on uh, the kinds of things that um, will make an operation more sustainable in the long term, uh, both economically and ecologically. And we can, the program is set up such that we can fund conservation management plans whether or not there's a conservation easement involved or a covenant on the property. And so, uh, of course, that's also a big topic is rules for uh, covenants and easements. The statute sets out um, some limitations on that. We need to address uh, termed easements or covenants from terms of 20 years to 50 years, as well as permanent conservation easements. Uh, and so the commission will be working through that in the next couple of meetings um, to try to put some parameters around that. We've had some uh, great help from uh, what was the, the work group that helped develop the legislation. <clears throat> and a couple of the members are, are here. Um, Kelly Beamer is here and, and she's coming with us to Prineville for our next meeting, which is tomorrow. We like to piggyback these meetings and keep Laura busy. Laura has been helping us as, as well as one of our uh, technical experts. Um, to help uh, help the commission members work through some of these issues. Uh, Laura's helped us facilitate meetings um, to, to get this work done. 
And I would also like to thank Liz Redon, who is here, who has been our facilitator throughout the process and um, doing a very good job keeping us on task and trying to get to the finish line uh, in time. And one of the reasons for that is that if we have um, these program rules in place um, in the near term, we can then do a solicitation of interest to kind of uh, quantify the need for these programs out there that might help in uh, any legislative efforts that come to try and, and um, fund the program. Um, and so that's, that's where we're at uh, for now, and I'll leave it to Laura and Will uh, to talk about uh, their perspectives. Laura Masterson, I'm not sure I have too much more to add. That was a great summary, Eric, thank you. Um, looking forward to uh, the, this meeting, I think, especially um, talking about the easements. Um, the, I've been really pleased with the commission. I think the, um, the diversity of opinions, of geography, um, everyone's just really thoughtful and really engaged, so that's been heartening. I think, um, as a board, I think we should be really proud of that commission, and um, and I, I I think Will would probably say the same thing. I'm excited to see what um, what they have to offer um, post rulemaking. Hopefully, we can get some funding and um, get some easements on the ground. So anyway, that's what I'm excited about. Uh, Will Newhouser, for the record. Um, so a couple things I would touch on is, uh, you know, relative to yesterday and maybe the day before's discussion about collaboration, uh, one of the things that was interesting is we started out the process talking about our decision-making process. And um, although things may come to a vote at some time, uh, we've mostly proceeded by consensus, which with a thumbs up, thumbs down, thumb in the middle, kind of get a sense of where people are at. And um, if everybody's kind of in the same direction, then we just keep Barreling along, and that's worked out, I think, really, really nicely because uh, you don't have to come to a final conclusion necessarily, but uh, allows everybody to kind of indicate where they're feeling at the at the time. Uh, I would echo what uh, Laura just said about the the team. I think the commission has been terrific. It's a you know very diverse group. Um, not at the beginning that well integrated, but have figured that out over time uh, very nicely, I think. And uh, definitely has a diversity of opinions, and yet we are pretty much in consensus on everything that's happened so far. Um, the third thing that uh, Eric glossed over is that um, the real reason this is so uh, successful in the process so far is the staff. I mean, it is, we're, we're going through so much material so fast, and so, in the, in the commission meetings, we spent a lot of time getting the, the sense of thing and the direction, but then um, staff has a lot of work to do in between to turn that into actual language that we can use and review at the next meeting. And that has gone really, really smoothly. Uh, both to Eric and Liz and uh, Nellie's credit to uh, drive that process forward in particular. So, um, you know, it's moving, it is moving quite fast. Uh, I would say it's every two weeks, occasionally every three weeks. Um, so we've, we're fitting the year's worth of uh, meetings into six months largely. So it's definitely been, a, um, I'm seeing a lot more of Prineville and the road over Mount Hood than I'm used to. And so that's been, that's been good. Um, can't think of anything else at the moment. So if they, I'm certainly happy to entertain questions or comments about where we are and stuff. Did you more? No, no, Sorry. I was just going to. Yeah. Well, I was just going to take a moment to appreciate everyone who lives on the east side and how many meetings you drive to in Portland and Salem. I have a new appreciation for that drive and that level of commitment, having been every two weeks to Brineville now for however many weeks. That is not the east side. <laughs> Why we picked it. <laughs> any, qu any other questions? Well, I have one. Randy Labby, for the record. Uh, 
What's your impression on the commission here? The, uh, the, I see the farm sector is, is Chad Allen deemed to be a rancher or? He's a farmer. dairy farmer. Dairy farmer. Dairy farmer, farmer, yeah. So Woody Wolf is uh, rancher. Is, is kind of the only? No. Who else? Uh, uh, um, Mark Bennett, the natural resources representative, is a rancher who we just funded a conservation easement. Oh, for good. Yesterday. Oh, okay. As is and Mary Wall. As is Mary Wall's family. Uh, Nathan Jackson Nathan also kind of is, is both half and half, sort of, or something. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan. I do have a question. In, in thinking about the uh, heritage program, the, how Will that board, how will that board interact with this board, and what role will we play with that board in decision-making processes, mm -hmm. um, project approval? How, how is that? What's the vision for that? Sure. So Should. I'll do just one note first, and then Eric can talk about technical. One of the things that we are going to do, I was going to mention as we transitioned, is um, uh, first, a meet and greet. So we are offering to you all ahead of the June board meeting at Cascade Locks and Skamania. Um, we are going to have the Agriculture Heritage Commission meeting up in Cascade Locks that day. And between 3.30 and 5 o'clock would offer a, an opportunity for you all to stop by and meet them um, at Cascade Locks at the community center. And then actually the statute is really clear about your interaction. So I'll let Eric speak to that piece. Sure. Thank you. Eric Williams again. Can I... Um, Interrupt? Yeah. I want to see, maybe Laura and I should answer that, see if we actually understand oh, yes. how, how, how the commission hands. works. Yes, you should. <laughs> <laughs> Laura first. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you went first earlier, I'll go first. Yeah. Um, so let's see if I can, I won't capture, I'm sure, the detail that Eric has, but um, mm. the, the basic idea is that the Ag Heritage Commission's job is a lot of what we are used to doing. So in terms of reviewing actual grant applications, so similar kind of staff review, uh, uh, regional, re you know, technical review f uh, by experts who are not, not staff or the board. Um, so that sort of same independent model for review. Um, staff then processing that stuff to present to the commission to review just like we, have, well, like we did yesterday. Um, but those are recommendations to this board. So then this board will get our review of those applications and our recommendation of which ones to fund at what level. And then this board will make a final determination of which of those to do. The, um, you know, so it's, it's probably a little more, f there's a little more formality to it, I think, than some of our pass-through stuff that we currently do, um, but not but it's probably a little more similar to that in that you know, we, there is a body that's done um, the, the multiple levels of review already and made a strong recommendation to this board. But this board is, of course, always free to modify things. And I would just add that the same applies to the rules. The commission will be oh, yeah. preparing and adopting or approving rules to recommend to you for approval. You have the, the actual approval of the rules for the program. And we'll, we'll flash them up on the board in about five seconds and you'll get to vote on it. <laughs> uh, well done, Will, Laura Masterson. Um, I think I'm excited for the group, for the commission and the board to get together um, because I think one of the things that I've been really impressed with at the commission meetings is the level of expertise and engagement on the commission. Um, so I think, it, at least in my mind, that's what I was hoping for uh, w as this was all coming together. And I think, um, yeah, I, I, I feel like the, if it continues in the same direction, the recommendations that we receive from them are going to be really well vetted and high quality and very thoughtful. So. And just one final comment, too, on the composition of, of the commission is that you, there's also a former board member, Doug Kramer, on the Ag Heritage Commission. So he's very familiar with how OWEB operates, uh, as well as, of course, Bruce Taylor, um, who helped craft our constitutional language.
And made a loft garden for the record. I will say, so they, they wonder the same thing. Um, they've been wondering aloud what this looks like and who you all are and all of that. Um, Doug and Laura and Will have not scared them too much um, in their representation. But one of the things we explained to them last time was the technical review of the, of the um, FIP rules that we went through with you all in January. Was that January? And so we walked through and explained to them what you all did. Um, that what you weren't doing is saying, because the conversations had been had and you knew where we were headed, you weren't saying we want to flip this policy upside down. You were saying, boy, this wording doesn't say what we think you intended to say. And, w and when they heard that, I think they were really pleased that there is another entity who's looking at it and saying, well, if they intended to do this, we're not reading it that way. Um, so I, th I think that made them a lot more comfortable when they heard about the f how the FIP process worked with you all. Randy Lavi, for the record, uh, just for any th three of you, wh what's the next step in terms of um, transitioning from an operational budget uh, or a kind of organizational budget to a operational budget and what's the dialogue with the legislature on that? We will talk about that actually on the next agenda item under the ARB. Oh, sorry. But Laura and Will can jump in on that. We'll, we'll talk about that at the next agenda item. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Punch you in the Hey, we're transitioning to agenda item K. For the record, Renee Davis, Deputy Director. And clearly there's some interest about Ag Heritage Program funding, so we'll spend some time talking through that. Um, so this will be the first of two conversations with the board about our agency request budget, or ARB. We're starting the conversation today to just let you know generally the priorities and direction that staff have identified. Want, definitely want to have input from you all. And then we'll, we will bring a more refined package back to you in June. Um, I unfortunately will miss that, but made a will shepherd forth the conversation. And at that point- Where will you be in June, Renee? South Africa and Swaziland. <laughs> Can we move the meeting to South Africa? <laughs> exactly. We won't vote, I promise. Um, so at that point, we will actually ask for your approval so that we have time to prepare the agency request budget um, before the deadline um, for us to submit it to the Department of Administrative Services. So definitely want to use this as a, a conversation time to get your input and feedback about the, the priorities that we're thinking about. So I want to start with just a general overview of state budget development, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the budget outlook. We touched on it some yesterday during the stent during the spending plan. I think that it's this mooing is mooing at me. Okay. Because it's the live let cam. Oh. oh. Yeah. Oh. I didn't put it there. It was there when I got here. It's live. It's, it was mooing? Maybe we'll just, it is literally mooing at me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the distraction. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about the state budget outlook, um, and then we'll dig into the priorities that to date the staff have identified um, for the agency request budget. So we budget on a biennial basis um, for state agencies. We begin with what we call the base budget, which essentially um, are the resources needed for any particular agency to meet their mission at a basic level. Above and beyond that, there may be additional needs that an agency identifies. We have to separately make the case for why those additions to our base budget are needed. And we do that in the form of policy option packages or policy packages. So later on, when you hear me talking about policy packages, those are the above and beyond our base budget that we have identified that there may be need for. And that we would like the um, Department of Administrative Services and the governor's office to consider as they're looking towards the 2019 to 21 biennium. Um, so our agency request budget is due to DAS, the Department of Administrative Services, at the end of August. Past that point, DAS and the governor's office work together to look across the board at all of the, the ARBs that have come in from the various agencies, not just natural resources, across the board. So including things like education, corrections, um, healthcare. 
and ultimately um, the, the governor's office will identify a package um, for a budget request that results in the governor's request budget that typically comes out in early December. Um, so what will happen is those individual agency budgets will be put together um, with some back and forth with the governor's office, but the governor may add some separate policy packages of her own um, to really help to advance some priorities and initiatives that she may have. So just to help you to understand the mix of things that are happening essentially in that September to early December timeframe. The governor's request budget is what serves as the foundation for any budget conversations during the legislative session, which will kick off in February of 2019. So if um, there's something that we have included in our agency request budget that does not make it into the governor's budget, we are not able as an agency to advocate for that. We can only advocate for those pieces of um, our budget requests that are included in the governor's request budget. So just want to provide some clarity on that. Actually, I'm going to pause it before we move into budget outlook and see if there are any questions about just the basic budgeting process that the state uses. Any? One question. Uh, it's Meg Reeves. Um, Renee, um, does, does OWEB, is all of OWEB's funding lottery? Is there any general fund? There's no general fund. We are primarily lottery. We do receive a significant amount of federal funds, though, yeah. from, from National Marine yeah. Fisheries Service via the Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Fund. So historically, that's made up about a third of our budget. Okay. We do have some other federal funds, NRCS, as an example, mm -hmm. um, some um, Fish and Wildlife Service funding through coastal wetlands. Those are smaller, more project-specific um, allocations. And then we have more recently had some other funds coming through both um, Oregon Department of Forestry for forest collaboratives, but we also receive salmon plate revenues, salmon license plate revenues, um, although folks may be transitioning to whale plates soon. Right. Um, that those typically are in, you know, less than $500,000 a biennium for salmon plates. And, and so this is, this 10% um, reduction budget is based on a forecasted reduction in lottery revenue and unrelated to the rest of the state's Correct. problems. Correct. Yep. So we have to account for the full package of all of our fund sources, but it's based on what revenues forecasts are looking like primarily for lottery for us. Okay. Thank you. So any other questions about budgeting? Uh, Will Newhouser, um, so back to the Oregon Ag Heritage Program. So the agency expenses for that, do they come out of the general fund uh, allocation from the legislature, or do they come out of the 35% um, measure 76, which can go to all kinds of agencies that do related stuff? So if we could hold that until we talk about Ag Heritage Program, um, but to be clear, we're still actually talking through fund source for Ag Heritage Program, because this is a, this is a new foray for us. Any other questions about general budgeting? Okay, so in terms of budget outlook, Maida mentioned yesterday that um, in, overall the state um, revenue forecast is still in a growth phase, but it is definitely projected to grow much more slowly than it has over certainly this this current biennium and even last biennium. Um, say the same holds true for lottery revenue still expecting a slight uptick, which is good news because uh, about a year or two ago we were uncertain how the new tribal casino in southwest Washington was going to impact lottery revenues, but things are still you know, overall growing, but again at a, at a slower rate than previously. The issue though um, in terms of the overall state um, revenue forecast is even with that modest continued growth, um, the chief financial office is not anticipating that those revenue increases will be able to keep up with the increased costs associated with certain program areas for the state, such as healthcare, education, corrections, payroll cost increases, and we still continue to work through the PERS issue um, in terms of public um, employee retirement. So the message from DAS currently is, is for agencies to expect to be in a cuts or reduction um, scenario. We do not yet know exactly how large that will be. Every biennium we are required to submit a 10% reduction scenario, all agencies are. Um, in the last uh, few biennium, we haven't had much impact in terms of those cut scenarios in, in particular for us. Um, but we will go through that exercise and we certainly will keep you all updated as to how things are progressing with revenue forecasts and also how our, how our ending balance is looking. As made a reference yesterday, there may be some value 
value to retaining um, some of the bump up in terms of um, lottery revenue uh, limitation that we received this biennium in case any buffer is needed next biennium. Um, so it's not a dire and grim situation, but we're prepared to submit a, a reduction scenario up to 10%. So any questions about that? Or made it anything to add on revenue forecast? You're right on. Okay. Okay, so now we'll get into the meat of, oh, go ahead, Randy. Did you have something? Um, so now we'll move into specific budget needs. So um, in the last few biennia, we have um, approached the agency request budget development by first really looking at a functions analysis of the agencies. What positions <laughs> do we currently have? How are those positions being used? And what do we anticipate on the horizon, both in terms of maybe the need to continue some past policy packages, or if we are going in some new direction or taking on a new initiative, what additional resources might be needed. So we went through that exercise, um, and I'll refer you to first attachment A, just briefly to point to you that it is there. So this, in, this is a current organizational chart for the agency, to, just to give you a sense of how our staff are distributed across the different um, sections within the agency and the functions that they serve. And so that really did help to serve as a foundation for what you see in attachment B, which is what do we actually need or expect, anticipate that we need for the 1921 biennium. So I'm going to walk you through this shortly, but I do <laughs> want to make one note. Multiple agencies, not just OWEB, multiple natural resources agencies are, continue to be in communication with the governor's office about um, potential cross agency cross-cutting priorities that could result in policy packages that, that either would be built in potentially to our agency request budget or ultimately to the governor's budget. So as an example of that, I will put on the table Klamath. Um, there are continued conversations among the agencies about is there... Um, is there logic and rationale to us putting together something that is interagency in nature, potentially included in each of our agency request budgets, that would help address some of those very thorny issues that we continue to face in the Klamath? So I say that because when you see the um, attachment B in June, you may see an additional policy package or two um, as an outcome of those conversations with the governor's office. So let's dig into, oh, go ahead, Maida. Uh, Maida Lofsgarden, for the record, one thing I just want to mention for the um, the folks who are on other boards and commissions who are here today, this this looks different, I think, than what you typically see, because the vast majority of our budget is the grant side. So you all delve into the the budget. Um, in pretty big depth and with a lot of public feedback when you're doing the spending plan. And so this really, it, it, the thing I joke about, Renee um, mentioned the org chart, that is our entire agency on one page, not groups of staff, that is actual individual staff members on one page. So, so when we talk about our POPs, it's very small, I think, compared to what the Fish and Wildlife Commission sees, what the Water Resources Commission, um, Board of Agriculture and others. So just, just for scale and context, you spend the majority of your time at this board working on the budget. This is a very small piece of that. Go ahead, Gary. It's Gary. Uh, just a question here. I don't, uh, forgive me, but what is, uh, like, as on the conservation outcome coordinator and on all the rest of the org chart here, what's the NRS uh, for? Is that a pay grade? It's a classification within the state system, so it's a natural resource specialist level four. Okay. So there are levels one through five for that particular classification, and depending on what number the classification is, um, the responsibilities and expectation have an increasingly higher bar. Okay, thanks. Okay, so in terms of just some basic, oops, sorry, go ahead, Laura. Laura Masterson. Um, are the are the potential um, new hires or additions on this org chart? They are not. Okay. And is attachment B the blue and the white? It is the blue and the white. What's, is there, is blue mean something different than white? Just to help differentiate rows for you. That's good. Because <laughs> I wasn't, I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> there, no. Um, 
So in terms of just overall um, context for the table that you see in attachment B, um, one, these are estimates. Refined numbers will come to you in June um, as we dial in um, needs and, and also staffing costs. Um, so you'll see the first column is a description overall of um, what the particular item is. The amount column is our estimated cost. Those are biennial costs, so please don't think that in a single year, Audrey is making $285,000. <laughs> that is not the case. Um, that um, line, or that, I'm sorry? <laughs> you want to go? <laughs> That column also includes position, associated position costs, so it is not just salary. There are other costs built into that, you know, office space, travel, et cetera. Um, the FTE, if there is FTE or staff time requested, then we have put um, what that is, part-time or full-time. And we have um, attempted a crosswalk to the current strategic plan priorities. Um, so from our perspective, these are where the positions um, most appropriately fit and connect to what you'll be talking about shortly with Meta and Steve. So the first um, package is our program continuity package. This continues um, to maintain resources that we actually currently have in this biennium's budget, hence the program continuity. Um, so two positions are included in that. One is the conservation outcomes coordinator, the NRS4 that Gary asked about. This is Audrey Hatch's position. It has really been invaluable in terms of some of the interagency work on coordinated streamside management um, and strategic implementation areas with ODA and other agencies, um, extensive work in helping us to ramp up the telling the story that we talked through yesterday, other interagency efforts such as a stream team and conservation effectiveness partnerships. So um, we see great value, especially given the em emphasis on coordinated monitoring and shared learning under the strategic um, plan priority seven. There's a companion position to Audrey's that we actually are recruiting for currently. It's an NRS three, so one step down but will we'll essentially help to take some of that responsibility and burden off of Audrey and Ken Fecho, our effectiveness monitoring coordinator, who are carrying quite a lot in this arena. So those are the two pieces under program continuity. If it works for everyone, just let me know if you have a question and I'll just keep walking through the Alan? packages. Uh, Alan Henning, uh, the limited duration positions that currently exist, are they a year? Are they calendar year? Are they fiscal they actually, year? They're biennial. And thank you for flagging that, Alan. So since this was um, printed for your book, we actually, in, in internal conversations, have decided that for the NRS4 position, we're actually going to request that that be transitioned over to permanent. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the, the NRS3 that we're recruiting for currently would be retained as a limited duration two-year. Okay, so flipping to page two of attachment B, program enhancement. So this is where we get into the space of we know that we have a need for certain resources, but they currently are not included in our budget as a policy package. So there are a number of different pieces that you'll see in here. Um, the first um, item under program enhancement is contracted services. We have determined, made it noted, we're a small agency. Um, we have an incredible workload. Some of that workload, though, is um, best completed not by staff here at OWEB, but but more effectively covered by um, contractors. So a great example of that is our use of contractors with the land acquisition program. We don't necessarily need an appraiser on staff. What we need is to have contracted services to be able to go to an appraiser to ask for that assistance. Um, so we're asking for currently our um, estimate is $375,000 in contracted services to cover a number of agency needs. One, acquisitions, as I mentioned. Two, um, some additional effectiveness monitoring work there. There are certain types of work, in particular more scientific studies, that are best handled by a consultant or a contractor rather than in-house with our small staff. Um, and it isn't always a great fit for the grant side of our budget. Um, also some improvements to our biennial reporting under the Oregon Plan for Salmon and Watershed, statutory requirements, and then staff training. Um, the focus here is around um, effective management of grants, I would add into here, I suspect that when you um, see this refined version in June, there will be some mention of the strategic plan and some contracting needs that we may need for some aspects of the strategic plan. So the next item in program enhancement that we've identified a need around is online um, systems project management. We currently, um, and you may remember from the October meeting in Lebanon, 
we have really begun to transition to much greater use of online systems. We now have online grant applications. We are in the midst of ramping up um, some system improvements to really more seamlessly connect from time of application to project completion and, and post-implementation reporting, have a much more integrated and seamless system. We currently have a temp position who helps us with that project management around online apps or um, online systems, scoping those systems, working with our IT staff to um, to make those uh, programming improvements and then doing subsequent testing. We could actually use a half-time position um, as we continue to move to more online system use. So we're requesting that. Then um, the final piece under program enhancement is um, you all, as I mentioned yesterday, will be approving some new focused investment partnerships in January of 2019. We currently have three partnerships coordinators, although one splits his time doing senior policy coordinator work. So Eric Hartstein, Andrew Dutter, and Jillian McCarthy all um, assist with FIPS or uh, more of our partnership type projects. Two to three new FIPS would really stretch them workload-wise. So we currently have put in a placeholder for an additional partnerships coordinator to, to assist with the FIP program. So I'll jump to what folks have really been wanting to talk about. Oh, sorry, Rosemary. Um, may I notice? Rosemary Furphy. Under contracted services, you reference you can't use Measure 76 funds. Where would these funds come from? Oh. Where are you proposing? Go ahead. Yeah, so we are not able to use our 65% um, grant funds for contracting, so these would be requested as part of the 35% um, funding that, that is on our operating side, but it would be in addition to that, essentially. So it wouldn't be taking, for example, from the funds that would go to Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife um, on the 35% operating side, it would be an increase on the operating side to address these additional needs. And if, if you look, Rosemary, um, it says um, OWEB Measure 76 grant funds are not eligible. It's, that's, that's the key. It's mo Measure 76 operating funds that we would use, not Measure 76 grant funds. Grant funds. Okay. Yep. So any, oh, go ahead, Randy. No, for the record, Randy Lavi, this is an aside. The next item on our agenda is our public comment period. So if people, anybody in the audience has, is going to be commenting, there's uh, additionally to Erica Maltz, please see Derica to sign in. Thanks. That's all right. Okay, so moving to page three of attachment B, Oregon Ag Heritage Program. Um, so to Will's question, um, in some way, we are um, asking for a package of resources to address um, OAHP needs. So the vast majority of the resources that we're requesting, we're um, estimating um, $5.25 million would be to actually fund the grants that would support those, pro those working lands projects on the ground that could emerge um, from the Oregon an Ag Heritage Program, we're estimating that we would need about um, $700,000 to $750,000 for staffing resources to stand up this program. It is um, different from our current acquisitions program. There are pieces that are related, but we could definitely use um, some additional staffing resources to help on the working land side. So there are um, three positions that we would be requesting, um, one in the um, operations and policy um, analyst realm, so more of a program administrator, um, an additional natural resources um, specialist for um, who would help with more of the technical work and then an administrative um, staff person to help with the, the logistical and administrative workload around the program. So, yep, go ahead, Alan. This is Alan. Um, OWEB's got a great grant program in terms of functionality. The grant folks do an incredible job of moving money, managing money, tracking money. Will we be using any of the existing OWEB staff to track Oregon Ag Heritage Program grants? Or is that, are they going to merge right into our grant processes? You want to go ahead? <laughs> Um, for the record, Maida Lofsgarden, yes and no. Um, the That's clear. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
the uh, specifically, <clears throat> for example, on the acquisitions, uh, the, the easement and covenant program, um, we will have a position that operates exactly like Miriam, but Miriam's workload could not handle adding that many more um, projects on top of it. So we will have the same position. Um, the operation policy analyst that we're talking about here um, actually would be over, not, not supervising, but would have kind of coordination over that whole program so that we could help direct folks whether it makes sense to go through the Measure 76 process or whether it makes sense to go through the Ag Heritage Program. Doing a lot of the outreach, a lot of the work that Eric does right now for public hearings and those things could move to that OPA for. They would all be managed under Eric. Um, so the access is still to the other, to the RPRs, the Focus Investment Partnership Program, there's still a lot of that coordination, but because it is not Measure 76, we also have to be very careful about what our staff are billing their time to. Um, so we also, but we will use the same fiscal processes. Um, Cindy and her shop will be the, the exact same folks. It's just what we're doing is basically adding more grant staff because we don't have the existing um, capacity within our current staff to manage, to actually manage those grants. Rosemary, for fee, as a follow-up, does Cindy have the capacity to take on that additional? I mean, just thinking through yes. on staff that are already seem to be working at full and above capacity. Yes, they do as far as the grant payment process goes. The, the, the bulk of the work that occurs and the way that our system is set up right now, the bulk of that, you know, look, checking out to make sure the payments are right and all of that actually happens with our program managers. Um, so our fiscal staff are processing payments. They are processing a lot of payments, but adding the few more that come in from this program isn't that big because the lift is done with the people who are actually doing the program management. And that's where the extra resources will be needed. And to circle back on <laughs> the question that Will asked and Maida um, touched on just now, this program is not eligible for Measure 76 funds. The priorities of the program are sufficiently different, so we would be looking at other fund sources, including things like Exploring General Fund as part of our agency request budget. Okay, so transitioning to item four on page three, um, from here forward things are fairly um, straightforward. So carry forward is a standard policy package that we have in our agency request budget every year. So this would allow us the ability to carry into the next biennium any um, non-lottery funds that we still have available um, and allocated to open projects. So this includes the federal funds from NOAA Fisheries under PCSRF. This would include any coastal wetlands funds that are pending, any um, Oregon Department of Forestry funds under Forest Collaboratives. You get the picture. Um, so anything that's non-lottery, we still have to ask to use in a subsequent biennium. So that's the carry forward piece. Um, you see um, the TBD. This is something that we put in right before we submit our um, agency request budget. So we have the best possible number and then continue to refine it through time as we understand what is closing and spent down and what's open. Um, moving to item five, additional grant funds. So this is a placeholder. Um, every signal from um, our conversations with Oregon Department of Forestry is they are interested in continuing um, using OWEB as a grant administrator for the Forest Collaboratives funding that they have received from the legislature. Um, so we are building in um, a request to allow an additional $750,000 to come into our um, budget for the 1921 biennium um, so we can receive those funds and then um, administer those on behalf of Oregon Department of Forestry is, as um, Alan mentioned, really leveraging the grant making machine that we have rather than building that capacity in another agency. And then flipping to page four of attachment B, um, this is requesting some additional federal funds limitation. Um, NRCS has approached us, Natural Resources Conservation Service has approached us um, about providing OWEB with some funding that could help fill both technical assistance needs and some administrative type capacity needs around the state um, that their offices currently are not able to provide but could be provided by some of the other um, restoration um, infrastructure organizations out there, such as councils or districts. So um, this is a placeholder. We anticipate somewhere around a million dollars um, that would come in um, for to address these capacity and technical assistance needs um, to really fill a gap that NRCS is, is struggling with because of some of the hiring freezes um, that they're experiencing um, just with the recent federal transition. 
So I will stop there and see if anyone has additional questions. Gary? Gary, uh, Renee, I just, uh, um, thinking about this, when this is all, this re request submitted, is, um, does this go in as, as one package? And if so, did, can they cross things out and reduce uh, these different items or what, what typically occurs? So that's a great question. Actually, it goes in as a number of different packages. And you're not seeing everything because there are other, some, some other fiscal mechanical type packages that Cindy works on. Um, so we typically have probably uh, 10 to 12 packages um, included in our budget. It's broken out by the operating side of our budget and the grant side of our budget. So the benefit of that is that they could say, we, we don't like package X. Um, we can cross that out. They actually, though, within a package, so if we use the um, program enhancement package that has multiple items in it, they could say, we completely understand the need around contracted services and another partnerships coordinator. We don't think you actually need that IT project management assistance. We, we are not accepting that um, to be included in the governor's budget. So they can, they can um, delete um, at multiple levels. Okay. Rosemary. Rosemary Furphy. For, um, thank you, Renee. For number six, those NRCS funds, can we direct where those go in support of priorities OWEB has and some of the ag programming that's happening? So or I'll look to Meta, but I believe we, we would determine the priorities for those funds in coordination with NRCS to meet their needs. Yes, this um, Meta Lofts Garden for the record. Um, these are specific funds that NRCS has for very specific items that they are running through us. This is not a grant. Um, so in one case, it's the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program um, uh, technicians that we pay for. So we and NRCS share those. That is a competitive grant process, but both we and NRCS are the ones who select the grants along with ODA. Um, in the other case, um, it is a set of very specific technical assistance dollars um, that actually through some great work from the Oregon Association of Conservation Districts and John Keith, um, they were able to um, negotiate a, an agreement with NRCS at the state level to bring some funds in, but it is very specifically for technical assistance in areas where NRCS has needs. So I would, I would call that, for us, it's very much a pass-through. There's a need that they have, and we as a state agency, with the um, fiscal management authorities that we have and the ability to do agreements. We have agreements with districts and councils all the time. It's much easier for us to do that, for them to do one agreement with us and then us to do multiple agreements with districts. So um, this is not, it, it is not like PCSRF. It is a, a very specific program that we're helping them administer. Laura, Laura. Laura Masterson. Where some of this stuff is currently in the budget and continuing, are these numbers the same as? In, in terms of the program continuity? Yeah. So they would in, include increased payroll costs and okay. other associated position costs. Okay, great, yeah. thank you. Other questions? Alan. The NR, oh, this is Alan, on the, um, NRCS funds, the additional funds of $1 million, do we have to get additional authority to spend that? So Maiden nodded, so if the, for those folks who didn't see it, yes, we have to get that. That's why we're asking for federal funds limitation to, so that it doesn't bump up against an issue of we then can't spend Pacific Coast Statement Recovery funds because we don't have enough federal limitation. So. I, so just to wrap up, next steps is, again, as a reminder, we will be bringing a refined package to you in June for your review um, with much tighter budget estimates. Um, we will then submit our ARB to Department of Administrative Services at the Governor's Office by the August 31st deadline. Um, and then just one final budget-related item that you see on page two of the staff report. Just um, as an, by way of update, we did in March submit our um, our grant application for the Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Funds to NOAA Fisheries. I talked with the Deputy Regional Administrator of, at NOAA um, 
last week, I guess it was, and they are expecting to provide feedback to all of the applicants by Memorial Day. So at the June meeting, you should hear an update about what uh, hoped, our hoped for um, federal grant amount will be from PCSRF. And just as a reminder, in the last few years, it's been somewhere between 14 and $15 million. And it's a really critical addition to the budget. So we're keeping our fingers crossed. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Randy Labby, for the record, um, we're going to move to our morning public comment segment, um, item N, and I want to welcome Erica Maltz uh, of the Burns Piot Tribe, who's here to introduce herself and her tribe, and am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Erica Maltz, and I'm the Natural Resources Director for the Burns Piot Tribe. I wanted to take the opportunity of the board meeting in our Aboriginal territory to welcome you to the area and also to provide a technical point of contact for the tribe. Um, and finally, to thank the board for your investment in relationships with tribal governments and your continued partnership on our priority projects. So with that, welcome and thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions uh, from the board? We're we regret we're missing Jason Robeson this morning, and he would have wanted to be here. Any other? Uh, Rosemary. Oops, Rosemary Furphy. Hi, Erica. How are you doing? Good, Good. to see you. Um, can you highlight maybe a, a particular project you would love the board to know about that your department is spearheading currently, or anything yes. of interest that you'd like to share with us? Sure. So um, our department handles a lot of elements of tribal sovereignty. Primarily, uh, we work on um, implementing various actions that uh, increase or protect the ability of the Burns Paiute tribe to co-manage fish and wildlife resources with federal and state agencies. So that tends to look like, on the ground, um, a multi-pronged strategy um, and where we partner pretty broadly in a variety of areas. So one upcoming project that we have, um, we're actually in the process of applying for OEB funding for in partnership with, um, potential partnership with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. We're looking at the, um, evaluating the feasibility of implementing um, highway passage, uh, wildlife crossing measures at one of our mitigation properties for Bonneville Power Administration. The property is located um, outside Ventura, Oregon, and it uh, is one of the highest deer strike areas in the state of Oregon. It's something like 6% of all deer strikes in an average um, year that end up in mortality occur in that 13 mile stretch of highway. So that's one of our projects we're working on. Um, an example of an active partnership with OEB currently, we are um, expanding wetlands on that same mitigation property um, in order to increase the wildlife value. We also um, do a variety of projects related to fish recovery. Uh, we've been a leader in bull trout recovery in the Malheur River, um, and we've also spearheaded salmon uh, releases for the purpose of ceremonial use of our membership. Um, in that same, in the Malheur River. Erica, thank you again for being here. Any further questions? Okay, we'll look forward to exchanges with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next item we have on the, is our strategic planning session, which is going to last about uh, 90 minutes. We don't really deserve a break yet, but Considering it's going to be 90 minutes, we'll have a 10-minute break, and we'll reconvene at uh, 25 minutes to 10. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Will Newhouser for the record. Uh, we're going to move into the strategic plan update, which is a really short uh, item in the agenda, but I allocated a lot of time to it. Director and my um, partner in crime this morning, Steve Patty, with Dialogues in Action, we will be um, walking you through the um, strategic plan. And I, I just wanted to start um, and provide a little inspiration 
um, for what we're going to be doing. It's going to be, of course, in partnership with our um, board members, um, reaching out and looking at very, very high places. Um, we're taking a long view um, as we move forward, um, so we're making sure that we're looking out for any LECs coming our way. And of course, we will be helping each other um, out through this uh, strategic planning process. So I appreciate that we have a board who's willing to help each other through this work. I'm going to turn it over to Steve, who will um, tee us up um, and give us a reminder of where we are and some background, and then we'll jump right into it. Good morning, Steve Patty, for the record. Uh, it's great to be here with you this morning. We are uh, this morning reflecting on phase three of the strategic plan. And uh, this is the, the last phase, so we're approaching the end of our uh, planning journey here together. Uh, let me remind you of what we've done um, previous to this so that you can fit um, our conversation today into context. We've been taking uh, strategic planning in three, three movements. The first movement was a get clear phase. And uh, that, that encompassed a, a few different uh, tasks. We did six listening sessions around the state with groups of stakeholders. We did 30-something uh, in-depth interviews, also with stakeholders and key informants. We uh, deployed a survey and got some data um, on the perspectives of those uh, uh, across the state involved and engaged in this kind of work on what, what is happening within OWEB. The product of that first phase was a document that we call Who We Are. And that's a description of the, um, the ultimate aims, the premises, the intended impacts, the best means of a web. And that, that is intended to be the first, uh, the, the first part of the written strategic plan, just a, a refreshment of the identity of a web. Uh, from, from part one, then we did, uh, we stepped into part two, which was a get focused phase, from the get clear to get focused. And uh, th this was a time when we gathered, you gathered together as a board, and we had some se senior staff involved as well. We identified the priorities going forward, what you wanted to focus on over the next five to ten years. We identified eight of those. We built out the, the description of, the, of, of those and the characteristics of the future. From phase two, get focused, then we stepped into phase three, which is a get moving phase. And, and this is a phase where we, we, we begin to think through, well, what, what are we going to do in order to be able to advance the priorities in front of us? And uh, we convened a few different Imagineering groups. And um, we brought in the uh, external advisory group at that point, as we had earlier in the, in the who we are uh, phase as well, and began to think through all the possibilities of strategies to move forward and advance these, these eight priorities. We then um, identified uh, um, others to talk to uh, um, that were both with, within uh, the field as well as, as external to the field to be able to, to get some advice and some ideas um, on, on other potential pathways and strategies. So uh, staff members went out, did conversations, had focus groups, I got on the phone with all kinds of people, uh, both um, here in Oregon as well as 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 is even regionally or and, and nationally to be able to inform some of this conversation. That that then gave us a, 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 um, a suite of possible strategies for each of the priorities. From there, we narrowed the strategies to the ones that seemed most productive, and then built out um, some ideas of the objectives, some key activities some outcomes, and we begin to work on some metrics related to that. So that's phase three, get moving our frames of action. What you see in front of you right now is that phase three. So um, I wanted to describe the whole process so that you can see that phase three really nests in the first two phases as well. So in the, in the uh, uh, um, a more robust description of prior the priorities phase two, and then in the who we are phase one. So when we, when we put the whole strat plan together, it will have those three parts to it. So our job today, um, our task today, is to um, is to think through this this third um, this third step of the frames of action. And uh, we're going to take um, our conversation also in three parts. So we've done some updating since you have heard um, and since we were with you last on the priorities and strategies. So we'd like to update you on what the strategic plan is now saying. 
and then uh, think with you about some of the implications for this. Well, for you as a board, how does this then, what does this mean for your decision making? And for the staff as well, what does this mean internally for the organization? And um, talk that through with you, get your perspective on that. And then uh, thirdly, other questions that you may be wondering um, as well related to just the, the finishing up the process and how we communicate this externally and, and such. So our next 90 minutes, we'll walk through these, these three parts. Uh, but before we get into it, just a, a couple of reminders for you. Um, one is that we're, we're trying to keep this strategic plan at a, at, a, at a strategic level, at a high enough elevation. There, there has been other work on operations kinds of things that don't show up in, in what, you're, what you have in front of you. So when you look at the actions and the outcomes, those are general and fairly high level and intended to be so. Um, the staff have, uh, are already building out some operational kinds of things that emerged from the process so far. Um, given your approval, they will continue to build out the operational plan. So it's a it's fairly high level of, of strategy. Um, secondly, a reminder that we're thinking in terms of a five to ten year horizon. So as you look at this, it might be overwhelming <laughs> to think there, there, there is so much here to wrap our arms around, but we're anticipating um, uh, tackling these things, moving forward on these things over the course of a decade so that we won't do everything right at, at, at the start. And then uh, th thirdly, we're, we're also intending for this strategic plan to be, um, to be adaptive um, and directional. There's an interesting article that emerged from the Stanford Social Innovation Review a couple months ago that they said there are two kinds of strat plans. That w one kind of strat plan is, is um, where you create a plan and stick to it, the conventional strap plan. Uh, another kind of strap plan is an adaptive strap plan where you set a direction and you test to it over time. We're intending for this to be more of an adaptive strap plan than a conventional strap plan. This, this sets direction that then will evolve going forward. So our strategies are not comprehensive. They'll prob probably adjust and adapt and evolve as we learn more. And you'll see even for some of these areas of priority, the strategies are we need to learn a few things before we can actually design good and effective strategies. And so you'll see that, that there's, there's a let's take a few steps and then we'll decide what to do from there um, kind of approach. Okay, um, as we walk through these, these three points, um, just to organize your thinking, in, in the update, um, particularly if you could give mind to uh, issues of clarification and recommendations for the, for, for the updates and the adjustments. For the implications part, um, we're thinking particularly if, if, you wouldn't, if you could weigh in on the, on the implications for fidelity to who we are, the significance, direction, and risk, those, those kinds of things in your mind. And then, um, and then for, the, for the questions part, things you may be wondering about, um, your input on just vetting the process and steps forward. All right, Maida. All right, so uh, we are gonna jump in um, first to the priority and strategy changes, which you have as a red line or blue line, as the case may be, in your um, attachment A to the staff report. I'm not going to walk you through this in order because that would not be any fun. Uh, instead, what we're going to do is talk about technical changes first and then talk about big changes. And this is a little bit similar to what we did with you guys with the focus investment um, rules in January. It felt easier to just kind of set aside the technical ones so that you can, we can see if you have any clarifying questions and really then focus our time on the bigger ones. Um, so I have up here, a, I'm just going to walk you through what you see up on the screen and then I'll show you on the page where it is. So in January, you saw um, a set of priorities and strategies, um, as was mentioned, eight priorities, and then the staff had taken a first shake at giving a set of strategies to you that we thought, based on all of those interviews and conversations, would fit the priorities. So you saw the first piece. The majority of changes that you're going to see are actually around the strategies, because you all gave us feedback in January, and we made changes based on that. So some technical changes first. In under priority one, 
We combined, you'll see the um, develop and implement broad awareness campaigns. We combined that with the last one that you see on the page, which was highlight personal stories. What we found was that highlighting personal stories is a way to develop and implement a broad awareness campaign. So it didn't, it felt like we were, we were actually just had an action running there. So we moved that up and made that one strategy. The other thing that we did here under number one is we moved a strategy from the strategic partners priority over here. So nothing else changed with it. It was one that we felt actually fit um, much more closely under this broad awareness piece than it did under the strategic partners priority. And you'll see why when we get to the strategic part later. Um, but we've, we've really felt like this fit here. So, so those changes are really a lot more technical in nature. And I'm, as Renee did earlier, I'm just gonna look up on the technical ones. And if you happen to have a question as we go through them, I'll catch that, and, but otherwise I'll just move through the technical changes. Under priority two, which is on the second page, very minor wording changes. The first one we wanted to note who we were listening and learning and gathering information from. And the other um, was really we want to focus on creating new opportunities. Evaluation is one component of that. For priority three, um, and this is where I'll, I'll just note, we're going to come back because within these there are some big changes. So I'm, I'm just going to speak to the technical part, but there are actually big changes in priority three that I'll come back to. But the technical changes, um, we deleted, you see a, pri a strategy here, provide funding and support for regional shared services. Again, that was really an action. It wasn't a strategy. And so you'll see it moved under actions later. Um, and then we moved a strategy over from the strategic partners priority, and that's that one there at the bottom, continue to catalyze and increase federal and state agency participation in strategic partnerships. So again, just a shift for that one. All right, under four, <clears throat> the new four, because there's a really big change in that the old four went away. We'll come back to that. Um, so under the new four, what you see are just very minor wording changes to um, strategies one through three. Um, and, it, and I'm going to come back to, to strategy number four because that's a bigger change. So on the first three, just minor changes. Okay, for priority five, again, there are a couple bigger ones I'll come back to, but we had minor wording changes on strategy one, strategy three, and strategy five. We just, all, that, all those are is just clarifying wording there. All right, under number six, and again, I'll come back to the major changes shortly, but under six, there were just wording changes to priority one and two. And then last on priority seven, um, these look a little bigger, but they are just wording changes on uh, uh, priorities or strategies two and three, the wording was just a little awkward, so we tried to make the wording more clear on both of those. So I'm gonna stop before we jump back to the big ones and just see on those technical wording changes, anything worry you, anything jump out. Laura? Uh, the new four, number two, is that a wording change or a big change? Uh, I, we counted that as a wording change. We didn't feel like, so we say, um, this is where you s we changed identify to align. Is that okay. the one? Um, what I'm reading, in a, what I'm confused about in align is uh, who's giving the direction. And I would be concerned if the foundations were giving the direction yeah. to us. We will talk about that when we get over to the actions and you'll see that it is it is not that, it is more of a, um, neither giving direction to the other. It is, here are our priorities, where do they align with your priorities? Not trying to actually force alignment, but to find it in existing priorities. Okay. And that will come out in the actions, I think. Okay, but it's not clear in the Got it. title. Okay. Thank you. Clear. So it's more a seeking alignment than it is a... Um, directive. Directive, okay. Gary? Great. Gary? Gary? Uh, page five, 
Item four. That one I'm going to come back to. That is a big change. Okay. So go ahead and ask your question, and I'll make sure I address it when we walk back through the big changes. Okay. Uh, tell me, the third line up from the bottom, uh, what is aging water? Oh, it's aging infrastructure, so aging water infrastructure and okay. other infrastructure. Yeah, I got that yes. after I was reading it. We will fix it. that. <laughs> Verify. Okay, good. All right, any other questions on these before we jump to the big ones? Laura. Uh, the new number five, um, note working lands. Yeah, that's a big, I'll come back and that's describe a big that one. one. Yep. Great. All right. So, I'm also going to note as we start in the priorities, because we're not going to come back to these priorities, one, two, six, and seven, those were all wording changes. So I'm going to right now focus on three, four, and five. That's where our big changes happen. So starting with priority three, what we did, and, and I'll say, I, I'm going to blame um, board member Reeves, and she knew it, she shrunk as soon as, as soon as I said it. I'm not, because she was one of um, many voices. Uh, if you remember, and as you can see here, we had a priority three that was about community capacity, supporting resilience in watersheds, and a priority four, that was about strategic partnerships to achieve healthy watersheds. Many times with the external advisory group, with former chair Dan Thorndike and others, folks really got confused about three and four. And so I would try to describe it as community capacity is really local, this is about on the ground stuff, and strategic partnerships are really statewide, and they're about the statewide thing. Um, and, and then we presented to the new board members, and Meg asked the exact same question for about the 15th time that we had heard. Not, she didn't ask it for the 15th time, but, um, and it got my brain thinking in a little bit different way. And then the staff started working on actions and the actions were nearly identical for the two. And that's where it really hit between that suite of conversations over time and the actions just, there wasn't a way to string them out because if you think about community capacity, it could be a statewide organization like the Nature Conservancy who is providing community capacity. It's a local organization who is providing statewide leadership if they're a member of OECD or the network. And it just, it, it start, we started to realize that those things are kind of inextricably linked and probably ought to be. So I'm gonna walk through what we did here, but then wanna open it up and make sure folks are comfortable. So what we did is put community capacity and strategic um, partnerships support resilience in watersheds. And then what the other thing we did is then pulled the language from number four into that header about what we mean. So we wanted to make sure that all that language was included. Um, and really we felt like it was appropriate um, to keep those two pieces there. Um, then what we did, as I noted before, we moved the priorities out of strategic partnerships into other areas. So you see one of them landed here, one of them landed back under priority one. I think one of them landed, might have been it. Oh, and one of them became an action. Um, so we had a, a set of strategies, and when I get to four, I'll walk through where things moved to. But that's, so that's what we did is we, we um, moved things to where we felt they were more appropriately aligned and then combined the language here. I will quickly flip now to the next page and talk about, um, so the, the completely lined out priority four. Again, you see some language moved to three. Um, <clears throat> the first one, they identify areas for alignment. That actually is the priority, <laughs> That's, um, it, it flows through everything. And so it didn't really need to be its own strategy. You will find it flows through the actions. Um, what you see here is 5.1 moved to diverse and stable funding. Uh, or I'm sorry, that first one moved to become a part of all of the diverse and stable funding. 5.1 moved to broad awareness. Um, the continue to catalyze and increase state and federal participation, that's a broad awareness. The develop more robust partnership support for stakeholders is a part of all of the strategies under three. So you'll see actions that tie to that. 
and then the providing tools to help partnerships assess and improve their effectiveness we felt like was really an action that was way too far in the weeds. So I want to stop there for a minute and just let you sit in that, see what questions you have. I'm going to defer them to Meg if any questions come up. <laughs> see, Liza Jane? This is Liza Jane. I have a um, question of our definition for levels, at all levels. Ah. Later we say partnerships of all sizes, which makes sense to me, but levels feels uncomfortable. Okay. When we were, and so you can help me with clarification on wording, when we were speaking of levels, we were talking from the Watershed Council to a group like the Nature Conservancy, who's operating both at a local, a regional, a statewide level, to organizations like the Network of Oregon Watershed Councils, who is a statewide with local organizations. So we were trying to frame that, um, and sizes then being one to two people up to larger size. So if there's a better word for levels, um, and you can think on it and, and let us know. That's, that's what we're seeking is all the way up to federal agencies and then down to that, that um, local organization on the ground. What if you said organizational levels? Okay, something like that. Sort of scope. So we had uh, Rosemary and Laura next. Rosemary and then Laura. Rosemary Furphy. So, um, so I think these are, a lot of these, the integration seems to make sense. What I am looking at is the title of priority four and the title of three, and are we capturing that as well? So title for four is strategic partnerships to achieve healthy watersheds. Very key, basic thing for OWEB. And then this is community capacity and strategic partnerships. I agree with that, but this supports resilience in watersheds. And is, I just put the question out, does that really mean the same thing? I'm not sure what resilience means. I know what healthy watersheds mean. That's something we use a lot. And I'm not saying I don't know what resilience is, but we're losing that healthy watersheds part. And I just sort of want to call the question of um, not losing something. So and resilience your... may be quite, you know, everyone is a different definition and I don't know. So, is your proposal? I just want to check this because I think it might make, or it's something that might make sense for you all. Instead of seeing supports resilience in watersheds, we could actually say community capacity and strategic partnerships achieve healthy watersheds. Resilience is a component yeah, it, of that. I, and and just checking around the table, is that comfortable? Anybody have concerns with making that shift? Yeah, Will is practicing his thumbs up. <laughs> we won't train you on what that means, but generally, okay. All right, thank you, Rosemary. And then who was next? Uh, Laura, and then Laura, Paul. And then Paul and Steve. And I was just going to. And then Randy. I was, Laura Masterson, I was just going to make a recommendation for um, Liza Jane's concern, and that was diverse organizations and agencies provide various forms of capacity. Organizations and agencies, what was the end of that, Laura? Diverse organizations and agencies. Provi provide various forms of capacity. It just skips levels and goes on to what it already says. Okay. Good. All right. Well. Um, yeah, I guess I, this is just an editorial comment. Building on that was just the um, um, trying, especially in these a a active, um, you know, the, the statement of goals or these title sort of uh, statements, um, you know, more active prose as opposed to passive language like support, facilitate, you know, those kinds of things are very passive, whereas, you know, achieve, lead, you know, move, um, you're more active. Good. Okay. Steve? Yeah, under your old priority four on page four. Can you, can you move the mic a little closer? Under your, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, no, it's um, Under your old uh, priority yeah. four, the second to the bottom and the previous and the one above that talk about stakeholders in general. And, uh, and it says these are moved over to the community version. But when I look at the community version, it says 
organizations and agencies at all levels, and then the next sentence will evaluate approaches to help stakeholders. And it seems to me that in that case, the stakeholders are referring to organizations and agencies, and there doesn't seem to be a place mm -hmm. where the broad stakeholder, the landowners, mm -hmm. is in there. It seems that that concept is lost. Okay, good. That's a good catch. We will make sure that is re-included. All right. Other questions Randy? from the... Uh, Randy Labby, for the record. I don't know where this... Uh, notion should go, but I, I just was looking at priority three, and can we talk about the strategies as well? Yes. I was looking at strategy two, support best approaches to organizational community and partnership capacity. And I was, I'm an advocate for OWEB in the next five or ten years to be uh, not so much support, but be an ad, a, a champion and uh, help watershed councils all the way up to federal agencies uh, get to the next level of the High Desert Partnership example, um, TNC's uh, model at Zumwalt. Um, what's going on in, in the Tillamook Basin to bring together uh, farmers, ranchers, and environmentalists and conservationists because we've done enough of that to see that there's a great opportunity for advancement. And we've been encouraged it, but we, I don't know that we have actually um, focused on designing those kind of undertakings and, and actively training watershed councils in developing them. And that leads well, um, made a loft skirt for the record, that leads well into what Paul was saying, that support is kind of a, a weaker word than something like championing. So we'll strengthen the wording there and change that lead into champion, if folks are okay with it. Okay. All right. Anything else on the three and four? All right. So that covers um, the first two bullets here. I'm going to move to the new strategy four, which is the watershed organizations have access to diverse and stable funding. You had asked us at the last meeting in January if there was a more here that we should be thinking about. And we decided, yeah, there really is. And so that's the new number four. Um, what we are finding, and, I, and I, I'm a little surprised that we hadn't included this before, is that there is public, there are public dollars, there are private foundations, and yes, we can seek out corporate dollars, um, but there are complex issues that we need to work on that those uh, current funding sources just are not going to be of the size and scale of the challenges that we're seeing. And so we did add a new one here. Um, we are already starting some work with other state agencies, um, but we added designing strategies for complex conservation issues that can only be solved by seeking new and creative funding sources. And so as is highlighted below, um, uh, we've done a lot to advance large-scale restoration, but I know Meg would probably say, sitting with the Water Resources Commission, the size and the scale of the need that we have, the quality of the infrastructure that is 60 to 100 plus years old, um, we have uh, done a real disservice in the state to those things that support our natural resources, and we have not adequately incorporated things like climate change. We have not adequately incorporated things like green infrastructure and the benefit that it can provide, um, particularly in areas of water. So we added this, and then you'll see it's at a very, very early stage when you look at actions. So checking on that one to see if that matched what you guys were thinking when in January you said, give us something more here. Um, and if you're comfortable with that strategy. Um, Meg. Uh, yeah, Meg Reeves. Um, I, I'm really happy to see this strategy. I do have some, I'd like to talk more about this 
but in the action section probably. So perfect. All right. All right. Moving Laura? on. Excuse oh, me, Laura. Sorry. Oh, Liza. Lauren. Oh, okay. Liza. Um, Laura, then Liza, and then Will. <laughs> Laura Masterson. Um, are there sidebars and or concerns about the way we move, the way OWEB wants to move forward into this new area? And where do those conversations and or, where, where does that belong in the conversation? Because this reads like, yeah. go forth and maybe do some things that I'm uncomfortable with. <laughs> we will uh, we will talk more. Actually, I think this ties well with Meg's note too. We'll talk about that over in the action sites. So that's where the you'll see, I think, and can check our sideboards. Liza Jane. This is Liza Jane. Um, number three, um, helping uh, corporations invest strategically in the health of their local watershed. Um, one of the issues with finding funding in rural communities is um, the corporations only want to invest where they're present, and fortunately they're not present where we live, but unfortunately we can't access those dollars. So um, if there's a way to expand local there or acknowledge that. Are you comfortable with us saying something like lo local watersheds and watersheds across the state? Are folks comfortable with adding that? That, that might be a role of OWEB to help people think beyond their own watershed? Okay. All right, I'm gonna. So, oh, Will, sorry. Only how's you? Um, so back on, on four, uh, you mentioned green infrastructure, which is not listed there. So whether that should be added, uh, since it was in your verbal description. Okay, good. And and I think I. I'm I'm looking forward to talking about the implementation side because there are aspects of this, that make me uncomfortable. It, is that OEB's job? As big as the need may be, what is OEB's role in, helping drive that? Good. That answering, but thank you. Good. I'm glad. Steve? This is a general question. Uh, this one deals with primarily funding, and I, I know we've dealt with partnerships. Are, are we missing any other kind of al alternative ways to, for example, implementing restoration, and like uh, people volunteering time or just, uh, you know, in-kind kind of services? Is that somewhere captured in any of these? It is. It's built in, the, in that strategic partnerships and community capacity piece. I think you'll see some places there where it isn't necessarily OWEB's role to be moving the volunteers, but that, that, it, that working with local communities, we can help them build their resources up. So I think check again when we get to actions, but I think some of that is incorporated there. All right. Any other questions? Rosemary. Uh, Rosemary Furphy, one thought on this number four where you are quite specific at the end, the last sentence, jumping right in on climate change, aging water. It could be addressing something like these future challenges, these future needs, for example, climate change infrastructure, because it sounds as though you're sort of nailing it down as to what those are and what they're going to be in the future, and I think we're not sure. There may be new emerging things. So those are examples. Yep. You aren't kind of making your list of what you're work, going to work on. Great. Keep it more flexible. All right. Thank you. Okay, moving to um, the, uh, let's see, priority five. Um, so two things here. In January, Liza Jane asked if we would add a working lands definition. What we decided to do for sake of consistency is actually use and slightly expand a statutory definition of working lands. So this is the statutory different definition that comes from the Agriculture Heritage Program. Um, and we just thought for consistency's sake that felt like the most comfortable thing to do that we could point, this is what we mean. The only addition um, is in the Agriculture Heritage Program, it does not reference forest land because currently it is not a component of the program. So we added forest land because for the rest of our work, it is. So that's the note in the addition that you requested at the January meeting. The other thing that I think Liza Jane, you suggested as well at the January meeting was we didn't really have a listen and learn strategy 
in this working lands space. So we added right after implementing the agriculture heritage program, the wording is a little different than it is under diverse communities, but we added strengthening engagement with a broad base of working landowners. The goal there is to work with those who have direct experience to gain an understanding of how to improve conservation on working lands, that that strategy would lead to some of these later ones. And Laura? I don't usually think of recreation as a working lands owner. Help me with that one. Uh, where are you at? Oregon Research Page Natural six, Resource Agent Industries. Number two. As Oregon's oh, natural resource. As a natural resource industry. Agriculture, forestry, fishing, yep. recreation. And recreation is, we include it at, when we talk about it at the state level as one of our natural resource industries. So parks, state parks. Um, so for us it is, if it's not a comfortable thing for you all, um, but, but typically, yeah, we've included it as one of the. It's not particularly extractive. It's not particularly extractive. Well, well it can be, do it. depending on well, there you go. how it's used. Um, maybe, maybe part of the uh, confusion is that it's sort of conflating working, working landowners feels like working lands to me, which is, does not include recreation. So I, I'm not disagreeing with the natural, with the recreation being included as a natural resource industry, but maybe there's a better way to say, like not working, not use working landowners. I feel like that's maybe what's confusing to me. Is it Jane, do you have a thought or a comment? Yeah, go ahead. And then, this is Liza and Jane. Then I, I think it's really important um, to include recreation and I think in natural resources, um, and bringing people together uh, on land use and multi-use. And I think of, of course, um, fly fishing, hunting, those, those uses on ag land. I think I'm agreeing with you, but um, working landowners in the title, is there another way to say that? I would look to you all. Okay. Um, we, that's, it's the term we've been using. If there's a uh, better term you would like, I'm very open. I to mean, w like you, industry. yeah, why isn't it natural resource industries? This, so uh, as a reminder, this was about specifically getting out working with those people who are doing the resource uses on the land. So it wasn't about the industries, it was about Laura Yu and Liza Jane and the local conservation district and the Farm Bureau and the Association of Nurseries. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't about the industries, it was really trying to connect with the people. Um, so there might, and I'm not saying, I think there very well could be a better word, I just, I'm not sure what it is right now. So if, Maybe we can do a little group think on that, and like we did with the last one, if somebody comes up with a better term as we're moving through, jump back, let us know, and we'll circle it there. Does that work? I just want to be clear, the, 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 I agree with the impulse of this, and I think what's confusing is talking about working lands as a, and having a very particular definition for that it doesn't include recreation, and then talking about working landowners and including recreation. Yes, that's where my confusion yeah, is. I'm that's where I feel like it's not yeah. quite right yet. I'm very comfortable with the change. I just don't have a word for you. So again, we'll look for the group to okay. help us. Uh, Meg and then Jim. I, w I was just gonna say that the, I, I'm, I think it's really important to keep recreation in here, but it's also true that working land specifically does not include recreation. So if you wanna keep the, term, which I think is an important term to keep. Maybe recreation should be added into the definition of working lands. I mean, that would be one way to, to fix the semantic problem that we have. So that's one option, good. Uh, Jan, Jerry, and Bruce. Um, I like, this is Jan Lee, I like the definition of recreation in working lands. Um, in Clackamas, for example, we have purchased some property um, next to a, a county park, and we are going to be developing that with trails, et cetera. So we, are, we will be working landowners, and I think recreation fits into that. Um, Paul, Paul, Bruce, and then Rosemary. 
Uh, uh, Gary. Gary, I'm sorry. I'm looking the wrong way. Like Gary, Gary, thank you. I was <laughs> <laughs> down there, but he's not. Yeah. He raise his hand. Um, so while I was reading this, um, it was it was occurring to me that uh, you know OEB uh, right now. I mean, this is a this is a plan that's going to set. Um, some direction for what we want to do with our lands and, and waters and things for the state of Oregon for a while. And OWEB uh, spends a, quite a lot of time fixing things that uh, were damaged from, um, from uh, practices in the past. And, and so, you know, I was talking about this piece of transitioning properties and, and lands and um, these lands are going to transition, but I think what is even more important than that, that, that when they do, that the right type of person with the right ethic, hopefully, is the next person on these lands. And I think in the long run that saves a web and, and, um, and people a lot of Troubles down the road, and and I'm I'm not sure that that's captured in, in what you know in this in this whole strategy here. That, and and I'm not I'm really not sure how, how to do it, but I think it's it, um, it it's an important thing uh, that uh, you know we work we work towards having uh, managers on the land that are going to care for it and that, that have that have that ethic. That, uh, uh, made a loft's garden for the record. I, I would suggest we might actually add that onto the Implement the Agriculture Heritage Program. It's something that that group has been talking about a lot, about what that looks like down the road. And I think we might be able to beg some language from there, Gary, that could add into this first strategy. Okay. Uh, Rosemary Bruce Randy. Rosemary Furphy. Um, number two, I agree with it, and I think that's an important addition uh, for the title that seems to be kind of confusing us a little. Um, might be looking a little later in your paragraph there. You talk about working with a broad range of landowners, it includes all these different industries. So the title could be Strength and Engagement with a Broad Range of Landowners. Take out the working landowners. That seems to be kind of redundant because you talk later about this broad range of landowners. It doesn't have to. Okay. It's not working Where landowners per se. It just seems. You got Laura. We got okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Got it? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Bruce. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Bruce Buckmaster. Had you called on me in the correct order, I would have <laughs> said that and gotten credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, it's all uh, from the headline, uh, from the introduction, and all five of the strategies, it is number two that is the outlier as far as working lands. Uh, there's nothing that is referenced in any of the other four that is contrary to the, the clear language. So removing working from number two solves that problem, and you can leave the, the other verbiage in there. Way to go, Rosemary. <laughs> hey, are we Rand ready to Randy move? and then Meg? Well, I was going to compete with um, <laughs> Rosemary and Bruce in wordsmithing. <laughs> Although sometimes using the word industries is not a good connotation, but it's, it, we're talking about more than just um, landowners, and you have in your first, second sentence, Oregon's natural resource industries, seems like that would be a good substitute to, for working landowners because a lot of recreation interests don't own anything. I was involved with the Oregon Water Trust for years, and you know we were catering to the clean water people, the fish people, and um, we were overlooking the Whitewater River rafters, who had an interest in everything we did. And were supporting us, ultimately. 
So I, I will just say one note on this one, and it might be because we worded that first sentence wrong. The focus of this really was from Liza Jane's comment in January. It was about getting landowners who have not done projects with us to start doing projects with us. So it may be that we potentially misworded our first sentence to get Randy to where you are, but if you read the rest of it, the goal really was there's a set of landowners who are not working with OWEB or our councils or our districts or NRCS. How do we get them? So I'm, I'm actually, as I'm listening to you all, I'm a little worried that maybe our first sentence is sending us off on a direction which wasn't the request for the thing that we do. And if we maybe take out that first sentence, the rest of it actually ties actually to the objective that we were asked to. So we changed the title to what Rosemary said. We take out the first sentence, which I think Randy led you down a different path than what the strategy was actually supposed to be about. And are folks comfortable with that? It feels like that sentence maybe is what got us a little bit confused as well. I got to a similar point. The other option might be just, because you're really trying to explain why to care about the working lands, and we leave that part out. So the other option would be, are dependent on healthy watersheds uh, for this, and I'm not sure the wording, but for their sustainability, including on working lands. So those, those industries are dependent on, the, on working lands, not just public lands. Yeah. That would be another way to tie it to the, that opening sentence of purpose, if you will, into working lands. But Meg? Um, so so, uh, I want, so the, the, the title of the priority is about working lands as it's drafted now. And um, so I don't know if this is a matter of emphasis. <laughs> if, if we're serious about kind of pulling recreation into this, then we would say something about recreation since it's not working lands in the priority. But maybe it is a matter of emphasis and we don't want to emphasize um, recreational use being integrated into watershed health. I think it's a good idea to integrate <laughs> recreational use into watershed health, but I also don't want to kind of water down the focus of this priority. So, I mean, you could say, for example, the value of working lands and recreational uses are fully integrated and leave number two as it is, or just take out the working part or do some of the other edits we talked about. But I think editing two without doing something with the title of the priority, unless we're gonna just drop recreational reference for now probably doesn't work. Would I folks prefer to just drop the recreational reference for now? Um, because w without defining it, if we take out that first sentence, it doesn't exclude it. it we just, we, we got to a different definition here. So if we, if we drop that reference, it doesn't exclude recreation. It also doesn't highlight it. It's, it is, um, so the, the sentence would say, strength and engagement, with a broad range of landowners, which is what this thing was actually about. And then we just start and say, working with others who have direct experience and knowledge with um, working with a broad range of landowners in Oregon, a web will gain an understanding of how to improve conservation on working lands. It, it then doesn't say whether these are recreation, timber, forestry, fishing, it just, what we're talking about is private landowners here. And that's really what we were trying to get to. I, I just think we, yeah, I th I th a little grandiose in our wording. I think that would work. You might also consider moving that first sentence up to the what we mean area because that, it, that's essentially what it was doing, was trying to explain why this area was, is also important. Are folks comfortable with that, moving it into the what we mean? I, I want to move us on fairly soon. I think we're getting slightly into the weeds on this one. So I want to I want to maybe test that. Can we, you guys will get another peek at this, although it will be in a very pretty format at that point in time, and so it will be much harder for you to edit. Are you comfortable with that sentence moving just up into that description of what we mean um, and then taking it out of this. So when we talk about a broad base of landowners, I think everybody got comfortable with that language. Um, or would you rather that sentence just come out? Jan? And then we Jan? should really should move on. Yeah, Jan? Right, my concern would be is if recreation is not considered part of the use of working lands, um, that grants under the working lands provisions 
that have recreation components might not be accepted unless you feel that that's not the case? I think that is, would be very separate. That's a statutory concern. So I, th I, I actually think we're okay, Jan, although on our, on our programs, native fish and wildlife habitat is top priority, but we do allow recreational uses. So I don't think this plan will, okay. will hurt or help um, harm that. Laura and, then, Laura and then Steve. I was just, my preference I think would be to take that sentence out and I'm just, would be curious to have a little, can we have a little like thumbs up, thumbs down on that? Okay, so then we might be able to move on? Yeah. It would be great if we could move on. Uh, and I apologize, but we do have a ton of other stuff we want to get through with you all today. Um, so, a thumbs up to removing that sentence. Couple thumbs downs. Ooh. Wow. All right. Why, why don't you play, further conversation? Why don't you play with some alternatives, and we can discuss them at a later <laughs> stage. Okay. We will probably be emailing these to you because. Um, and asking you to give feedback to us, not broad conversation, because we can't do that by email. Um, because when we come to June, we would like to bring you something final. But I, I know these guys have been taking a lot of notes as well. I think Steve had a comment, and Liza Jane? Yeah, it just seems to me that working lands, in some people's viewpoint, and maybe rightly so, is, is more narrowly defined even though you say in the next sentence, broadly based, which would include recreational lands. So it, it seems like there's a little dichotomy within what we're talking about. And uh, I, I do agree that, that the kind of lands you want, owners you want to think about, if you maybe you use the word landowners, but landowners, there are recreationally focused landowners, whether they're hunting lodges or in hunting marshes and golf courses and recreationally uh, targeted land. So there are uh, RV camps. There's a lot of things like that that, that are being used and are, are they being excluded or included? I'm just unsure. So what I'm hearing, and I just want to say this because I want to test this with Laura. What I'm hearing from the group is include it. What I'm hearing from Laura is be careful about how we include it and how we word it. Okay, Liza Jean. This is Liza Jean. As, as you wordsmith, um, the second sentence um, under number two has the word working three times <laughs> and worked once. So that could probably... Good. I'm sure this will all come out great, <laughs> but... <laughs> we will fix that. And all right. Thank you all. Let's move on to the next... And this was super helpful. Um, I do appreciate it because it sounds like what we thought was just a kind of a technical thing has a lot of substance. So thank you for the, the conversation. Uh, Steve Patty, for the record, you'll see also an attachment B, which has um, each of these strategies built out, unpacked a bit. Um, a reminder that the the description of the objectives, activities, and outcomes are not. The description is not meant to be comprehensive. It's just meant, meant to give you as a board and others a sense of the direction of where these might go, where, where we're intending for these to go. So there might be other ideas, in other words, that will, that will come into play. Uh, there could be some activities that as we get into it, we decide that the, these no longer are germane to, to moving forward. So, so the ideas are high level, fairly general. They're illustrative, not meant to be exhaustive. Um, uh, work plans will be developed that will that will um, specify these with greater particularity, and um, and key metrics are still to come. So we're, we're intending to identify um, uh, at least one or two key metrics for each of these strategies. Um, it, uh, we'll, we will aim for both out, output as well as outcome metrics. So output, what we will do, outcome, what will result, and what we will watch related to that. There might be a few strategies where we will just have output instead of outcome or, or vice versa. Um, we won't take the time to walk through them all. Uh, you'll, you'll also, I'm sure you noticed uh, the, the footnote here that these are sequenced. So the, those designated one are, are, that would, are those strategies which are underway right now and the activities are, will, be, will be immediate or imminent. Um, number two, will, they will follow some type of, of, um, of initial in the first year or two 
work on others, and then three will follow that and will be subsequent. So for you as a board, as you, um, as you looked through this, uh, the, the key questions are, um, are, are these heading in the right direction? Um, are there any, any directional, uh, any sense about the direction that's making you uncomfortable? That, um, that as you see the, the beginnings of the build out, you, um, you, you'd like to, to alert us to, that, you know, this is, not, this is not the right direction. We need to change or it's too broad. We don't yet have guard, guardrails or it's getting us into a place where you, um, you're uncomfortable. So th those are the questions for you as you have taken a look. Are, there, are, you, are you pleased with, with the, the initial direction of these or are there any areas in which you'd like to weigh in on that? And we'll try to keep the conversation at a fairly high level as well. This would be really easy to get into the weeds, but that will be the staff job and you can talk to them offline on uh, particulars with that. Laura, would you like to provide us some comment in this area? <laughs> Laura Masterson, uh, this is a, kind of a general comment, but sparked by the fact that priority, um, the non-traditional involvement of partners, which I think is kind of an equity piece, is, is not is like a kind of later term um, in the first one. So I just wanna, I mean, given this is a huge priority for the governor and how do we make sure that it is kind of a, a or am I, maybe I'm missing I something, but it, that it is a short term. Priority, strategy 1.2. Strategy, well, so strategy 1.1, if I understood correctly, is kind of the first, first thing that happens. And under strategy, 1.2, which I think it has kind of a diversity component, is doesn't have a short term. It's like not happening immediately. Yeah, but so where is diversity? How do we make sure that we're saying like yeah. diversity is also like deeply embedded as a short term immediate goal? It is all of priority two. Fabulous. Yes. Thank you. So um, Laura jumped us a little quickly. We're just going to cover one thing and then we'll jump right into the details. So. This just, again, by reference of what Steve just mentioned, trajectory um, and what Laura was just raising, we do have, for a number of reasons, we have things that follow other things. In many cases, um, because the strategic plan, we need to learn stuff, as we were talking about before, before we design what we're going to do. In many cases, you'll see things that just need to follow on one another. But there are also, we also do have a very small staff. And um, part of why we're going to be asking for the grants from you all in June is to help shore that up so we can do some of this work. Um, but we also really ask staff um, who are very type A and want to do all of this next year, um, we ask them to be super thoughtful about how these things are staged and what we physically have time for. So that's what you're going to see is a little bit of a play in that. Although, Laura, on the, on the diversity piece, actually, we've got some very near-term actions on, on that one. Okay. So again, very high level here as you go through this. Um, one of the things that Steve reminded our staff about um, was that that you guys are setting those priority strategy directions. We want you spending your time there. Staff have really done a lot of work here, and it is your job to say, okay, did we point this the right way? So um, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to walk through the wording. Um, I am going to tell you some of the things about this, and then you guys can ask any questions that you have. Um, so first on um, priority one, Two things here, and, and I'm going to, um, Bruce Buckmaster asked a great question when we were on the tour in January. He said, great, this all looks good. What, he didn't actually say, great, this all looks good. He said, what are you thinking? And then he said, what are the implications for us as a board? What, how does our decision making look different? What are the implications for staff? So what I'm doing in this, Bruce, is actually attempting to ask, answer his question, which I think should be, is probably all of yours. So as I walk through this, that's what I'm gonna be highlighting. Priority one, this is a brand new area of emphasis for us. So this, as far as board and staff, this is different. We have not done a big campaign around broad awareness. As you see here, that is the biggest thing we are doing initially, is a partnership with Lottery, um, to do a very big, bold 20th anniversary campaign starting this fall and into next year, and a continuous feed of stories 
Um, this is something that we haven't had the lift to do before, but combined with Lottery and their investments, we're really excited that we can actually lift this in a way we haven't been able to. All right. Priority two. Um, I put, this is supposed to be a compass. So where you see something red, this actually may change how you, you are making funding or other board decisions later on. So again, priority two, um, leaders at all levels reflect the diversity of Oregonians. Um, this is a brand new area of emphasis as well. Um, we have short-term actions here, the listening, learning, gathering information. Um, we are planning for training. Um, it's gonna require some focus and time from both the staff and board. So things built into your agendas, training for boards, training for staff. And based on these, it may result in a shift in how the board considers grants that have a strong diversity, equity, inclusion focus. So you heard the five things we rank projects on yesterday. You may consider down the road, how do we encourage grantees to think about DEI? And that is, you guys are funders. So what do you want to start including in your solicitations? That's down the road, but just to let you know, that could be a shift in your, your focus. All right. Priority three. Community um, capacity and strategic <coughs> partnerships support resilience in watersheds. Um, the, um, we will change that to the wording that Rosemary provided earlier. Capacity and partnerships are our core strengths. So this is a place we're leaning into from a very strong position. This is what we've been doing for 20 years. Um, there is an evaluation component that's big for us, learning from our own work, learning from others. We've done a lot of monitoring around a lot of ecological things. We have not done as much monitoring. We are just starting into that with the partnership learning project and other things. So there's a big investment in evaluation here evaluation of our capacity investments and our um, learning from others. Um, this could in change your decision making in the future. It could inform the direction of future capacity and partnership investments. This kind of thinking is what got us started down the FIP path and you may think of other ways you want to invest differently down the road and there may be different offerings um, that you could have after we learn and do some evaluation in this area. All right, priority four. Watershed organizations have access to diverse and stable funding. Um, this is, what, what's different here is more of an intentional focus on our coordination with public funders. We, we do it well, we, we fund well together, but this is really leaning into how do we more intentionally focus our coordination um, and better understand our role. Accelerating, accelerating partnerships with foundations. Again, those have been kind of happenstance till now. That will be a lot more staff work and investment and partnership with board members to help increase that um, partnership with foundations. Um, so if you look here, there was a question about the aligning common investment areas. Um, what we talk about here is mapping the landscape of funding around the state and utilizing our convenience to highlight our successes and open dialogue with other funders about co-investment. So we're leading with where we invest and finding areas of alignment with other funders. Um, we would be entering the world of corporate partnerships. We have not done that um, from OWEB's end. It may very well not be us. It may be that we are helping make connections, but it is others who have those direct um, corporate um, partnerships and investments. And then on the creative funding piece, so this is where there were questions about the creative funding. Um, what we are proposing here, uh, sorry, let me flip to the right page, um, is working with partners to identify areas ripe for investment, um, particularly in the short term around the climate change legislation and how OEB funding aligns with that. In addition, there is an initiative that's moving forward around um, water inf and other associated infrastructure needs with the state agencies right now, and we are a key partner in that process um, to assess our, our current infrastructure needs. Um, the big change for you all is creative funding. OWEB does not have enough money to deal with these new complex issues, so us getting really clear about what OWEB funds and what needs new funding is one of the key decision points that the board's gonna have to be clear about what comes to us and what we need to be very clear that, that really we need to ramp up 
um, investments in Oregon to move this forward. We would not be doing this alone. This would be with the governor's office and the other natural resource agencies. This is really a governor's level initiative that we would be a part of. All right, priority five, the working lands piece. Um, again, this this is how OWEB was formed. It was ranchers and environmentalists sitting around ranches talking about repairing areas. So it's a foundational strength. We have a big lift around the agriculture heritage program. That's different for us. Um, there would be new partnerships uh, with agriculture organizations in particular and, and forest organizations as well. Our, we have a perfect program. Our stakeholder engagement grants are well aligned for this, but we may look down the road at different offerings and different messaging once we do some more listening and learning in this area. All right, the coordinated monitoring priority. Again, this is a big OWEB strength, um, priority six. This is something that we can do. We're a permanent funder. We are perfectly designed for this. Um, strong ties between six and one. What you will see out of this is probably more focused monitoring offer offerings based on what we learn, um, more informed review teams, and it proposes that you establish monitoring priorities and we work with others to establish a statewide monitoring framework. So this is taking the monitoring really to the next level with more focus, uh, more information, and established priorities from the board. And finally, priority seven, all of this is a potential shift in board decision making. Um, you have some amazing opportunities in front of you um, in the bold and innovative actions. Um, it's been both a strength and a weakness. We have done some great innovative investments in the past. Focus investment partnerships are one of those. We also have a really low risk tolerance in some other areas. Our acquisitions, for example, over time, we've had a very low risk tolerance. You as a board are gonna need to decide what your risk tolerance is for these different programs, and that will inform review teams. Um, if we are entirely focused at how successful a project will be, you miss an opportunity to do a very innovative project that might fail. And you as a board need to decide if you're going to reach into those innovative areas and take some risks on, uh, with the high reward but the potential for a project to fail. And we've traditionally at OWEB we've done some of that, but we, we haven't stretched ourselves as far as what this um, proposal would have. Again, there's a lot of research we want to do. We want to capture lessons learned. We're not jumping right into innovation, but we're going to be bringing you some things to think about over the next five to ten years that may shift how you think about your risk tolerance. So that was the quick run through on this. Uh, Will Newhouser, for the record, uh, I want to insert an administrative thing. In the agenda, we have an opportunity for public comment. If you want to do public comment, don't forget to fill out one of these yellow forms. Give it to Derica. Um, we have one so far. Uh, at what point do you want to take those? Probably at the end. Okay. Would be and then, uh, and I have some comments on this, but um, okay. let other people go first. Anybody have any comments on what Meta just went over? So, so my comment, this is still Will, uh, is I really like what's on these um, slides, and I would hope they don't get lost. I wonder if there's a way to work those in, because I think they provide interesting context and, and direction that um, shouldn't get f forgotten by the rest of us who aren't you know, operationally in it day-to-day, -day sort of. I could be the only one who thinks that, but... I, th I thought it was a really good way to sort of characterize where the board should be thinking about some of this stuff to help us, when we read the weeds, get down in the weeds, to not, not get overly obsessed with them. <laughs> uh, Paul. Hi, uh, Paul Henson. Um, so I just want to like clar uh, maybe clarify and confirm the earlier comment that in the, in the outcomes under each of these uh, strategy you know, subsections, um, you, you said um, staff will be developing more measurable and specific sort of markers. That's that's right. Yes. There's a lot of words like, you know, increase or more or, or explore, which is all that's really easy to do. So, but there'll be targets, right? 
Yes, yes, Steve Hattie. We, we, will, we'll, we will build out those with greater specificity so that they're not just, at this point, they're fairly general, but we'll, we'll step into that the next couple months. <laughs> Bruce. Well, and while we're working on that, while, while you all are working on the specificity of that, I would also like to see things that are time bound and measurable. Uh, one note on that, for the record, Maida Lofsgarden, there's kind of two components. Um, there's, there will be the broad time bound here, but staff will be developing very specific work plans that are also the time bound measurable that you won't see in the pretty strategic plan, but you will, you as a board will be seen regularly because we will be building this strategic plan into regular reports to you all. <laughs> Other questions or comments on this? Uh, sorry, Steve. Uh, First of all, I agree with Will that, that this is a really good uh, uh, summary of these, and I would even go so far as to suggest if there's some way they could be put into the plan, whether we're talking earlier on under the priorities as sort of a, a framework for why this is something we're looking at. It just seems like it really does provide that context. The, the other uh, question is some of the, uh, Steve's first comment, uh, to introduce this said that some of these things I think are just examples and and I you know so is that going to are they always just going to be examples and if so will that text be put into the uh, strategic plan to say here's some examples of the types of things we're going to do um, yes uh, we uh, that, that's a great idea to um, uh, to be overt about that um, so that one who reads this doesn't think this is comprehensive or exhaustive, or if we get down the, 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 the pathways and decide that it needs to be an adjustment to this particular piece, we're not held to that as a contract, but as a, instead as a direction. So we, we, can, we can certainly write that in so that it's, it's clear to the reader. And as an example, this is made a... Uh, Steve saw this and then laughed at us. Um, staff, when they wrote this, each of these are probably two and a half to three pages. They they jumped in whole hog, and we really then just had to kind of suck back out. So they really, the staff has done an amazing job already of thinking at a great level of detail. But for this, we then brought it back out to hear the here are the few kind of big things that we think that you would want to see highlighted. So they are they are moving right down that path. Others? All right. Next. Okay, one, one more um, step before we uh, uh, exhaust our time here. There may be, we, we were thinking through, we've heard a few questions from a number of you about some of the, uh, of what, what, what do the steps forward look like and, and also a few other questions that you've had. So we, we just package these together and I'm wondering, Maida, if you wouldn't mind walking through uh, these and just explaining and then anything else that you're wondering about, this would be a great time to ask. So one, uh, one of the questions we've had is, um, does what we are currently doing fit the plan? So where do we see open solicitation as an example in this? Um, and I would say from our end, and I'm also going to tee to one other piece here, um, yes. Uh, when we went back through, and for example, when I just mentioned the new and innovative actions, it doesn't say we are going to implement the open solicitation program, but what it implicates is how you might review open solicitation grants if you are looking to encourage some riskier grants. So it doesn't change the foundational structure of the things we do, but it changes how you might use the open solicitation grant program or the small grant program or a new offering. In June, we're going to be bringing you, um, Courtney and Liz have been working on this incredibly cool diagram that shows all of our grant offerings on kind of a scale um, level of partnership, uh, kind of level of risk, and what we were doing 15 years ago compared to what we're doing now and what you might want to be doing in the future. We're not designing the future, but it starts to let you think about in these areas, these offerings that we already have, these things that we're already doing, are they helping us meet the strategic plan or do we need to be rethinking them? Um, so, so we'll be talking to you a lot about that, but it doesn't shift what we are um, currently doing. The other thing I just want to mention here that I forgot to mention at the beginning is I had also had a concern about, um, Stephen mentioned the who we are, right, way back at the beginning. 
I had had a concern about is what we have here, does it link at all? And so we did an exercise, and you see it in this document, that the top of every um, strategy, it has an intent. So in every page here, you'll see an intent at the top. Every one of those intents came straight out of who we are. So we found when we got all the way down to the action level, it was easy for us to draw a line right back to the beginning of where you guys started us. So I just wanted to, it, it's linked well. And it's also linked really well to the long-term investment strategy. You already have a lot of these categories mapped. Um, the second piece, um, what kinds of new capacities? So that's the other question. Um, we, we have existing staff, we're doing existing things. What gives? Um, all of these areas for us are growth areas, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, that, that we need new staffing in all areas. It means we're leaning in differently for the new and innovative actions. Um, I do want to note in particular, um, the broad awareness will be using lottery. So that's a, a capacity that we will be developing in combination with the lottery program. Um, the second one, diversity, equity, inclusion, that is going to require time from the board um, Courtney is our lead from the staff. We're going to have a staff team. That's an area where we're going to have to just make some space for it because it is critically important. Um, I also want to note that we are adding staffing around evaluation and monitoring. Renee mentioned that earlier, that an outcome specialist um, we're interviewing for that position now. We see that as an area where we did need to ramp up our staffing. Um, what will we let go of to provide space for the new? Um, some of it is the current ways of doing business. So again, if you're talking about um, a working lands component, it's just how we're thinking about doing our outreach. How we invest our stakeholder grants may shift. Um, and so we really need to think about, are there some current ways of doing business that we can let go of because we're bringing in these new components. Um, staff are really thinking through that piece and, and again we'll be coming back to you regularly to talk about here's something that we're working on. Are you okay if we head this direction? Um, big shifts again. Um, one, two, five, and seven. Those are big areas and big shifts for us. Um, but we feel again more like those are shifts. Those are new directions that we're going to be headed so that some of our current ways of doing business are going to um, shift away. How do we communicate? the strategic plan. We are going to have a summary document, nice high-flying placemat type pretty thing. We will have in-depth documents that reflect all of the work that's been done. We've been <coughs> gathering your feedback along. Um, we will have work plans. We will be reporting to you. We will be reporting to the statewide organizations, the network um, of Oregon Watershed Councils, OECD, Coalition of Oregon Land Trusts. Um, I am excited enough about this that I can see some t-shirts. Um, we saw Oregon Food Bank did some really cool t-shirts out of this. Um, but our hope is that the way this is designed, it is in every conversation we're having. Um, so as we're talking to public funders, we are saying we're talking to you because of this component of our strategic plan. So we feel like it actually incorporates really well into our day-to-day -day vernacular. And then how do we keep ourselves accountable? We've already talked about this. Um, we are working on key metrics. Um, and then links to other existing measures. I'm just going to note, you guys have seen this before, our mission in the center. Um, so we have um, measuring our mission. Measuring mission progress is a lot related to our internal work. So how do we process map? How do we um, continuously improve? But that has key performance measures for the legislature. That has, will have strategic plan measures. Measuring mission impact is what are we doing and what are we seeing on the ground. So again, we already have a lot of tools for that. Implementation reporting, accomplishments reporting, effectiveness monitoring, which we will be adding to. And then the strategic plan measures we'll be bringing to you. And we also have legislative key performance measures. Um, we are an agency that really likes to measure stuff. Um, so you can see we already have a lot of places we can build this in, and Steve will be helping us with the specific strategic plan measures, but that's really only one way me we measure. If we do something new and innovative and it works really well, it also goes into our Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Funding reporting. It goes into our legislative KPMs. Um, so we'll be looking at a lot of different ways to measure as we move forward. So, uh, uh, Laura and then Randy. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yes. Please. The circles. Laura Masterson. Um, that one or the next one? That one. Okay. Um, 
Can you give me example, or can you give us an example of current ways of doing business, big shifts needed? Do you have things in mind, or I'm just, sorry, I, that, for whatever reason, that one kind of caught my attention, and I couldn't <laughs> quite wrap yeah. my mind around so, it. So um, let me, I'm going to move to the monitoring section to give an example, and I want to make sure I get to the right one. Um, so, so for example, uh, we talk about under monitoring six point, um, page 26, 6.5, um, defining monitoring priorities. So that's a big shift. This board, this board took a really, really long time to develop um, the focus investment priorities, and it was a very, um, it was a very cool process. It was a very fun process to watch. Um, <laughs> it was a very big shift. But what it resulted in is we're still doing granting programs. We are still doing restoration grants and TA grants and monitoring grants. We are now doing them in focused areas that you guys all defined. So that was a huge shift and a huge lift. We're doing probably the same number of grants that we were doing before. We were just doing them in different areas. Defining monitoring priorities would be something similar. You board are gonna have a big lift with the monitoring committee to define monitoring priorities. We may be doing fewer grants down the road. We may be doing more, we may be doing the same, but that's a big shift in the types of grants that you would be seeing and the focus and the priorities you would be having them in. So that's where it's a big shift, but it's not necessarily the long-term workload. It's getting you all to a place um, with those priorities. So there's that. The Agriculture Heritage Program would be another one where in that case, it's new staffing resources, right? That's a big shift. In that case, we do not have the existing staff or workload because those grants don't exist in our portfolio right now. Right. <clears throat> um, I think I understand the shift. Maybe my question is more about, and, and this doesn't have to be answered yet, but I think it's just maybe plays to the challenges of what are we letting go of to provide space for the new, right? Because I think FIP is not an example of that, right? FIP we're still giving the same amount of granting, but we actually need more resources. OHP we added, but we need more resources. So was the implication there that something, So like, FIP what, we, what are you talking yeah. about might be in terms of space? Actually, FIP probably is a perfect example because we didn't get more resources. So we- but we're asking for more resources. I mean, no. For people. staffing, for FIP, for staffing. Oh, for the new, sorry, yes. So in that case, I, I see what you're saying then current. In the, in, when we developed the FIP program, it was just a big shift. Right, right, um, and, and, but, it, but now it takes more staffing. So that's, that's kind of where I was, and maybe there isn't an example of it yet, but I just think yeah. this implies to me provide space. What are we gonna let go of to provide space for the new? And, and maybe we don't, maybe it's just a, maybe it's just, we're advocate, advocating for more, but. Yeah, so I guess, and I, 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 yeah, I that, think there's two pieces. One, right, you're right, Laura, I think a lot of that we're gonna see over time. But from the second instance, it, I'll go back to the, the FIP before. So now that, now that we are growing the program, we are looking to add additional staff. But when we created that program from scratch, it was just a shift in how we were doing business. And so we, we, sh we are, again, doing the same number of grants, we're doing them with a different lens. And as I look at a lot of this, like the diversity, equity, inclusion, big lift up front of training for board and staff and coordination, what may end up at the end of the day are the same number of grants, but you may be prioritizing asking grantees to think about something different. And so in, in those cases, I don't know that it's increased resources, but you're absolutely right. As we move into this on the working lands piece, for example, we may find after we do the listen, learn, and gather information that there's a lift that it takes that we don't have the existing resources for, but we're still in the gathering information stage. So I think down the road, Laura, you're right, we may see um, areas that need increased staffing. I don't know that we know what they are yet. Okay. Randy, Will, and then Rosemary. Uh, Randy Lavy. This is uh, just a minor point down, uh, Maida, the how do we keep ourselves accountable? Uh, when I first came on the board, the, there was kind of a uh, informal benchmarking with, um, I think it was the Ford Foundation, it was a grant-making focus of the organization. And with these uh, kind of bolt-on responsibilities and the uh, more sophisticated and enhanced monitoring, I was wondering if we could look for some other 
organizations that we could more effectively benchmark against? We will add that to the list. I think there absolutely could be. Yeah. Will and then Rosemary. Uh, will Newhouser, for the record. So um, one of the things that's niggled me every once in a while, but I keep putting off in order to see what we, where we end up with the strategies is related to maybe what Laura was saying, but um, doing the crosswalk of our existing stuff, in my own mind, I see a place where the capacity grants fit into our strategy, and I see into a priority, and I see where um, monitoring, and I see where technical assistance could fit in, and I struggle to see what um, a small grants program, where that would land in any of these, and actually even the open solicitation, because the open solicitation is not, we're not particularly looking for bold, innovative actions. We're looking for, you know, those are mostly workmanlike, you know, we know what to do, not some creative spark thing, and yet it doesn't seem to fit under anything else exactly. So um, I'm, st I'm still unsure about some significant parts of the existing program yeah. really fitting into some of these priorities is the way they're currently structured. Or do you want me? I agree. Okay. Um, so I'll give a couple examples. Uh, Will had raised this question with me before, and so I've had, thankfully, uh, some time to ponder. Um, so you're right. There are some where the strategy or the priority and the funding program are per capacity and monitoring right, perfectly in mind. Um, stakeholder engagement in the value of working lands um, and in the new and innovative because you will need to get community buy-in and support. But when we, there are things in particular like open solicitation or like the CREP program or like the small grant program. So I look, for example, at the small grant program as being a vital tool for the value of working lands is fully integrated into watershed health. It is, a, I say this all the time, I'm probably, it's not appropriate. It's our gateway drug to bring landowners in who have not had an interest in working those two to five to 10 to $15,000 grants will bring a landowner in how can we effectively use those in a different way, working with the Farm Bureau and the Oregon Association of Nurseries and others who have landowners who just need a little fix, but they don't even know that that program exists. So that's, you know, I see that in the working lands piece. Um, on the flip side, both under the value of working lands and under the um, strategic uh, partnerships, you may, on the open solicitation program, want to think about, as we do in open solicitation, how do we ask the questions about their engagement with working lands? How do we encourage them to use the stakeholder engagement program, which is an open solicitation program differently? Are you gonna see different grants in open solicitation because we're bringing a whole new set of landowners to the table who have not been there before? So I, it's not necessarily that you're gonna change an open solicitation restoration grant, but the landowners who come into that program that already exists could be entirely different because of what you do under strategy five. So that's, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily see that one as a plug and play. I see that as the thing we're trying to get people to come into. Um, and when they come, we have a whole new set of landowners who are coming into the open solicitation program who were not participating before. So that's, I, I see it flipping a little bit differently and again, you may think differently under diversity, equity, inclusion about how you want review teams to consider those proposals because you want to encourage um, diverse contractors, diverse landowners, and others to participate. So to, to follow up, uh, um, I, I like the two examples. So the um, small grants as a gateway drug then to me indicates that we would, one of the things we would be looking at is that the decision-making criteria for which grants to approve would become much more focused on are there, are there a suite of landowners who are not being reached? That is, will, will, that, will this grant help broaden that base as opposed to being a good little project that the Soil and Water Conservation District would like to do with this guy? If they've already got a whole lot of landowners that they're already are familiar with OWEB, then presumably they wouldn't happen in that area. That's the kind of question that yeah. your description it, raises for me. Yeah, it it's, could be that or, so from one end it could be encouraging them um, to reach out to landowners in areas they haven't worked. On the flip side, it could be encouraging Farm Bureau to get their members to go work with the Conservation District to come in with projects. So I think it's something that feeds in both ends. 
Um, so it, it may be that the board decides that you want to put an emphasis in your solicitation in your poll, or it may be that we use the stakeholder engagement program to actually push more landers, and you are still re ranking the program based on the highest ecological values, which is super important. Um, so I think there are a number of ways. I don't think we know yet what it will look like, but I think there's both a push and a pull option in something yeah. like that. So then on the, on the other one, I, I agree with your description that it could influence the way we uh, solicit open solicitation grants, but, the, but it still honestly doesn't feel like the program belongs under any of these. No. That it, it really is, I don't know how to answer the question, yeah. here's our strategic plan and we're gonna allocate gazillion dollars yeah. to open solicitation, which doesn't actually address any of these very yeah. directly that I can see. Yeah, and I would remind folks too, the, you have two things. You have your strategic plan and underneath that sits the long-term investment strategy. So even in our last strategic plan, you couldn't, you couldn't point open solicitation to, I think it would have fit all of the five categories. But then you say, here's our funding and we're gonna set up our funding to help drive um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that the two things are aligned exactly. I, and again, I guess from my end, I actually feel really comfortable that you're not necessarily boxing, particularly open solicitation because it's 65% of our funding into one of these, but that you are thinking about as we build our spending plan, is there a new grant type in open solicitation we want to think about? We just did stakeholder engagement. That's brand new. Are there other things we want to think about in that world that help drive some of this? Um, so I think you're right, Will. It, I, I wouldn't try to box it. I, from my end, I couldn't figure out how to box it into any one of those areas. So, and the, the last thing is you referenced the long-term investment strategy. And I guess I always assumed that, that, that this supplants that as opposed to layers on yet another. Because uh, that's really, yeah. to me, has always been, the, it is a strategic direction setter as opposed to a specific implementation thing. And so I, I have assumed that that was the thing that helped get us to here, where we are today. Because that's Yes, six, we, six, you have not ago. yet said that that would go away. So I think that is a board decision. decision we, we had decided last year in January when we started what we were going to focus on was the strategic plan. You have not made it actually a decision yet about what you want to do with the long-term investment strategy. And I think Rosemary was next, and then Steve. Uh, Rosemary Furphy, uh, two questions. One, with regard to the Ag Heritage Program, has anyone anticipated the grant requests that come in for that program, how it might affect OWEB's multiple programs, in that it may do some of the work that we would maybe have done, and that may free up resources, or they're completely separate, never to meet. So that's my first question. If that's, has there been a sense of that, that for the it record, may actually draw away? Yeah, for the record, made a loft garden. I, I don't think we have a sense of that yet. I think um, it will be a little while and a little bit of funding before we really know um, whether it would draw away. The easements and covenants in particular are, are very separate. We have people who are not coming to us for funding who would go to that program. But the conservation management plans, there's some very interesting potential there, and I don't think we've even tapped the surface of what that could look like between OWEB and the Ag Heritage Program, so um, still to come. Okay. And then the second, um, you talk about your particular needs and priorities, one, two, five, seven. How about six with regard to monitoring, and I make an argument there, in that without the monitoring, you may not even know the effectiveness of the things you're doing. So that's the separate bullet that we actually have already added staffing around evaluation and monitoring. So we, we recognize that that's a place where we, there's a particular emphasis in one, two, five, and seven. I should have, I should have called out six is that third bullet that says added staffing around evaluation and monitoring. We already have determined that's a need and we've, and have said we need to add a, a, an additional staff person for that which is the specialist we're hiring for now. The others we have not yet determined, like Laura and I were talking about what that need would be, but for monitoring, you guys are ahead of the game. Uh, Steve, then Alan, uh, Stel Randy, and Jim. Who's first? Steve. Um, yeah, I want to follow up on Will's comment, which I uh, am now thinking about, and it's uh, I don't want to go backwards on this process, but. But he does, I think, bring up a good point, is that ultimately isn't the goal, uh, the, strategy, the strategic goal is to improve watershed health and uh, th through largely through restoration. And the, our priorities now 
uh, are provide ways of doing that, you know. But nowhere does it really say that improving watershed health is a priority and here's how we're going to measure our outcomes for that. Now, maybe that's buried actually in the mission statement and, uh, and, and maybe that's the way it can be ultimately looked at, but then I don't know if you ever get any outcomes looking at your mission statement. Kind of like we talked about the stories the other, uh, yesterday is that ultimately we want to have measures, uh, yes indeed, this fish population was improved or this entire watershed has got better water quality or something like that, but they're not in these uh, priorities as they're currently listed. All right, so I'll speak a little bit to that. One, yes, it's in the mission statement. Two, very strongly in the who we are. And you're absolutely right, um, Steve, these are the methods of how. Um, so when we talk about um, community capacity and strategic partnerships, it is, in every one of these, it is to achieve um, watershed health. So we are not doing community capacity and strategic partnerships because we're doing them. But if you read in the language that Rosemary, we had talked about watershed resilience and now it's to achieve watershed health. That is, I, I do believe actually it's stated that, um, and if you go back to the Who We Are document, it is, it is really strongly, these things are in, all in service to watershed health. And I jump to this because, again, the strategic plan measures are only one thing we're measuring. And we say this to the legislature when we talk to them too. It, they give us key performance measures. That's one piece. We are also doing our implementation reporting, our accomplishments reporting, our effectiveness monitoring, on the ground ecological outcomes. All of that feeds up into this. It doesn't necessarily mean, um, so we could have reframed this whole thing around, um, you know, a certain set of species around the, the ecological priorities. These are the tools that we are using across the board to achieve watershed health. And I think actually watershed health is the, is the first impact, intended impact in the Who We Are document. So, so everything else will flow from that. Alan, then Randy, and then Jan. Uh, this is Alan. And, and, um, in, my question really follows Steve very closely is that where is it that we do define watershed health? I mean, OWEB and GWEB were really established to support salmon, salmon recovery going and really foster watershed health, but they were spoken in, in the same sentence. They were, they were almost one for the other. And in this strategic plan, salmon isn't mentioned at all. Watershed health is, and so is there a clear relationship somewhere between those two. Watershed health is defined as supporting specific species or what have you. <laughs> um, so for the record, Maida Lofsgaard and I'm gonna wander very carefully into this one because it isn't um, just about salmon. It's about sage grouse. Um, and so I, that's where I really like our mission statement that talks about watersheds and natural habitats. Um, so we don't, you're right, we don't link specifically salmon anymore. Um, into our plan, um, and a lot of the early conversations were actually over in, in on ranches in central and, and eastern Oregon. Um, so this, I, again, I'll, I'll take us back to our mission statement. It is healthy watersheds and the natural habitats that support thriving communities and strong economies. Um, if you remember back to January, the watershed conversation is meant to be all-encompassing. That when we talk watersheds, we talk ridge top to ridge top, so we encompass the health of from the top of the ridge all the way down to the river at the bottom. And we tried to use that as the more encompassing phrase. So, so now when we talk watersheds, we are talking from, from the top of the highest ridge right down to the Columbia River and the ocean. And do we define healthy watersheds? We, um, yeah, and I, so Steve mentioned at the be when we, he and I were talking, and I feel very badly that we didn't take him up on this. He said, hey, do you want to include the Who We Are document? Um, in this staff report as well, and I said, oh, that's just too much paper. You have a whole page that defines at the very beginning of the who we are. You guys asked us to do a whole write-up on what a healthy watershed is and, and all of the things that describe it. Um, we didn't print the who we are document for you today because we wanted to focus you on these, but I, I, um, I would recommend you go back to it. It was in the January board meeting, and it will be in this at the end. Um, and we stole some really good language from other places to help us define. Randy, then Jan, Meg, and Bruce. This is Randy. Um, you know, I don't, I'd be 
presumptuous to suggest what our constituency and the voters of Oregon would say, but I think when we talk about our work for uh, monitoring and we talk about going from salmon to sage grouse, I think they would be fully supportive of that. And I don't think that working lands is mission creep at all, but I think it's a harder leap for a lot of people uh, to reach that point from our original mission. And so I think that, I would hope that the strategic plan in some, at some point makes that case that working lands is directly uh, related to our mission, not indirectly or not uh, some wild um, leap from our original mission. Right. We will add, we will make sure that's the case. Uh, so Jan, Meg, Bruce, and then Rosemary. Yes, this is Jan Lee. This is to follow up a little more on, on Randy's comment. Um, in regard to working lands as a member of a soil and water conservation district, I'm a little concerned about how some of the definition and tools are used in that area because I know a lot of people think soil and water districts deal with just ag landowners, but today we're dealing with doing work for churches, working with cities, with urban people, backyard plans, uh, rain barrels, storage, and all kinds of other things with a range of diverse customers. So I just wanted to have people keep that in mind. Uh, Meg, Bruce, and then uh, Rosemary. So let me just ask first, I was out of the room, did we decide not to get into any actions and try to keep this conversation at a higher can I ask about a strategy? <laughs> okay. Um, this has to do with the uh, uh, four, priority four, strategy number four, about designing strategies for complex uh, issues. And I've been trying to formulate a question that gets at my generalized anxiety about this, um, this strategy. And it might be that the action items have kind of a toe in the water feel about them that make me think we're, there's uncertainty about how OWEB's mission fits here, is that? Because this is a function that the state desperately needs. I would love to see it happen, but I, I, I just wanted to hear your thought. You, you probably have all had this conversation before. Maybe there's a short version, or I can take it offline, of what the issues are about OWEB's mission relating to this. Yeah. For the record, Maida Lofsker, and I will give you the short version, and then okay. you, can, you and I can talk further. Um, you're right. This is this has a very toe in the water feel, and um, in part, and I, I put down a note here that I will. I think I'll be adding in the direct connection with the governor's office here because um, part of the toe in the water is the natural resource agencies really figuring out what each of our roles is. So, for example, the climate change legislation that's moving through, they're still trying to figure out where that's going to fit, where the different components are. We have to figure out how our funding matches or doesn't then match with that program once implemented. Um, the water infrastructure and other, the water and other associated infrastructure needs is a conversation we're having with water resources and ODF and W in the governor's office. So it really is us as a natural resource enterprise thinking about these new and complex funding areas and how we need to step in. But OWEB would likely never be stepping in alone. Mm -hmm. And the toe in the water is we need to understand both from the governor's office, from you all and the perspective that you bring and from the other agencies, how does our current funding fit in play and how does the structure that we bring benefit or hinder some of these things moving forward. So we may just be involved from a policy perspective. We may ultimately be asked to be a, um, a, a transfer of funding, but it really is super toe in the water because we, there's a lot we don't know right now. And, and any thoughts that I have, if I put them to paper, would absolutely be wrong in a year. <laughs> so I should think of it kind of like a placeholder, sounds like. Yes. Potential placeholder. Bruce. Thank you, Chair. Um, I beg another indulgence 
as a new guy, but trying to get an idea of what's how this all started. Can you tell me why the word help is in our mission statement? Uh, yes, and I might be one of the few people who can, maybe will. Made a loft garden for the record. Um, that was very, it was um, a long debated word when we did the mission statement, um, when we did the strategic plan previously. And the reason is OWEB does not go out and do the work on the ground. Um, and we don't hire the contractors. Um, we are not planting the trees. We are not bringing. So this is the question about volunteers. OWEB doesn't recruit volunteers. Our watershed councils and soil water conservation districts do. So the board at the time when they developed the mission statement was very intentional about the word help, because it is our job to support the protection and restoration of healthy watersheds. We, we as a funder are not the ones who do it. We don't have the staff like at ODFNW who actually have the biologists. Um, so so that's, that is where the, the word help came from. This board, um, we have not opened up the mission statement. It's something you may want to do down the road, probably not today, but that's, that's the impetus of the word. <laughs> she did say probably not today. So. Yeah. <laughs> Likely not today. Uh, Rosemary, then Liza Jane. Rosemary's done. Okay, Liza Jane. This is Liza Jane, new girl. Comment on the mission. It states um, thriving communities and strong communities, and oh, I think that's, that's a misstatement. It's strong economies. Great. That's just a text error. Thank you. Good catch. <laughs> and I think it's been there in a while for a while because we've been using this logo for quite some time now. So thank but you. Maybe not that on a T-shirt. Yeah, not that on a T-shirt. <laughs> I don't have anybody else on the list who wanted to talk. Paul, Gary, you haven't chimed in. You're good? All right. Just briefly, our next steps then will be to take your suggestions, recommendations, fold them into uh, to another iteration of this, uh, build out the metrics and, uh, and outcomes, put all three pieces together and uh, float them uh, for you, bring them to you. Uh, to the next board meeting for approval at that point. Those are our anticipated next steps. And I also want to thank the co-chairs and the board. Uh, in talking with the co-chairs ahead of this meeting, we thought this might take a little bit longer than the 90 minutes, and we're longer, but not too much longer. Um, I, I do want to um, thank you all, because this was a great, robust conversation. It uh, gives us a lot of feedback, and, and we will take it and work with it. So appreciate the conversation. Thank you. We'll switch to uh, the the strategic plan public comment with uh, Sean Morford from the Network of Oregon Watershed Councils. Thank you and good morning. This is Sean Morford with the Network of Oregon Watershed Councils. Um, this has been a fascinating morning in part because we're involved in our own strategic planning process and I've been working with five councils over the last six months who are also doing their strategic plans. So I've been geeking out a little bit on it and it's been, uh, it, 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 I think it really came together for me this morning uh, more than it has. So congratulations on where you've come. Um, there are so many points of intersection with the Oregon Conservation Partnership that I'm just kind of, uh, bubbling up here as I'm listening to the conversation. I hesitate to take you back into the weeds because I know you're probably relieved to be out of them. Um, and I made some notes as you were in the weeds, so I just want to share briefly just so we have it um, on the record. Um, with regards to strategy four, I, ha I talked to made a little bit about this already. A couple of things. Um, I passed out the network's goals and objectives for our strategic plan yesterday. Um, we have a strategic plan goal that shares many of the features of priority four. And so I just want to urge, uh, as this um, plan is operationalized, that communication happens early and often with the statewide partners around how priority four will, will happen on the ground. Um, I took note of strategy 4.2 on page 11. Sorry to go in the weeds on this. It really defines OWEB's roles with, the, with foundations. And I believe that OWEB has a natural role, not only in mapping um, the landscape with foundations and opening the dialogue, but really as a convener uh, of the foundations who are looking for leadership in convening around their strategic approach 
Um, I, th I think I, I would love to see these, this priority moved up in time and maybe strengthened a little bit in terms of what OWEB's role could be with foundations. Um, they are looking for leadership in, in providing their own collective impact around voluntary conservation. And in my experience, uh, having an organization like OWEB is a, is a natural fit. So I just want to sort of highlight that one. And we would love to play a, a role in, in, in helping those conversations happen, but I think it really needs an organization like OWEB to, to really con be a convener for the foundations, not just to have conversations, but to actually convene them around their own conversations about their own investments together. Um, last comment, I'm, I'm glad to see community and capacity and strategic partnerships show up in the same priority uh, because capacity for watershed councils continues to be a limiting factor for restoration. And one of the limiting factors of capacity is their ability to do collaboration. And we know that collaboration is a science and an art, and skills and knowledge and experience and collaboration is a big part of what watershed councils can use right now. So I just wanted to underscore that as an interest for us. We, we talk a lot about collaboration. We do workshops on it. We have conversations. But it's still a huge need among, uh, I can speak on behalf of watershed councils, to understand how to do collaboration, what, are the, what makes it work and what makes it not work. And so we really want to continue to focus uh, on that as a particular science um, in addition to the technical sciences. So that's all. Thank you for the opportunity to visit with you. And let's go. <laughs> Any questions or comments for Sean from the board? Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Randy Labby, for the record. Um, the board can please turn to tab P, uh, entitled the director's update. We're going to hear from Courtney and Courtney and Eric and Renee. Good afternoon. We realize we are all between you and the board oh. and the road. Um, for the record, Courtney Schaff, Katie Duzik has joined me um, and will briefly first talk about P1, the Lower Columbia River Watershed Council. I'm going to have Katie kick it off here, but I just want to provide a little context for some of our newest board members. In July of 2017, when the OEB board awarded operating capacity grants to watershed councils around the state, this, the Lower Columbia River Watershed Council was recommended by staff um, as a do not fund. After much discussion by our board, they were uh, provided one year of funding with several conditions and staff have been working with them over the past year um, on those conditions. And at the next board meeting in June, the board, the staff will present recommendations on the remaining funding for that council. And just as a little teaser, I've talked with most of the operating capacity subcommittee. We will be meeting via phone on May 21st to discuss staff's recommendation um, before that board meeting. And you all do have an invite from Derica. So thank you. <laughs> this is Katie Duzik, North Coast Program Representative. And I'm here, as Courtney mentioned, to provide an update on the council's progress. Since our last board meeting in January, the council has met several of their objectives. They have um, produced a MOU, a revised MOU with the Columbia SWCD that more clarifies the roles and responsibilities of the two organizations and how they interact with one another. Um, they have also held um, elections for their board, which is the first time um, that many could remember on that board. So they have um, a new board president elected um, and several other returning members on the board. Um, they've also met all of their first fund requirements. If you remember, we had a number of special conditions placed on their grant agreement um, that they had to meet in order to um, receive funding. And so they have met those, submitted a successful first request. And so Courtney and I have continued to work with the council as well as uh, Sean Morford of the Network of Oregon Watershed Council. She's been helping them through some of this process. And they decided to um, put an advertisement out to hire a new coordinator for the council. Um, and they the hiring committee selected a two-person consulting team 
to provide those services, which is a somewhat unique approach that we have not seen before, but the consulting team is going to provide two main deliverables to them, an outreach plan and a strategic action plan, two things that the council doesn't have. So they're also working in earnest on the work plan, which is due this coming Monday. So um, I'm hoping they'll be able to, to get that done. They've indicated they're working really hard on that. And I attended the council meeting earlier this month where the consulting team um, facilitated for the first time the council, and it seemed like they made some pretty good progress slogging through um, the work plan. So um, all in all, a, a pretty positive update there. And I think Courtney is going to talk a little bit about the next steps. Yeah. So again, we will be, uh, the council has their work plan due on Monday, and then we will be interviewing them. So we will, staff and our technical review team will meet with them, interview them, talk about what they've been working on and then develop a funding recommendation that we will bring to the board in June. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, next one, P2. Again, really, really brief. The staff report provides some great information. I recommend that you look at it. This is an update on the FIP gathering that we held in March. And it was a truly wonderful, successful event. Uh, you can see from the feedback that our grantees provided that they really seemed to get a lot out of it. And I think OWEB staff also got a lot out of it. There was a lot of follow-up conversations, relationships built, which was really our goal to get folks talking across partnerships, lessons learned, not recreating the wheel. And we were really happy with it. And I guess the key message lesson learned is that there was a strong preference to continue to do this kind of convening with our FIPS. And so as we go into the next award cycle of new implementation FIPS, additional development FIPS, OWEB staff will continue to have conversations about what future convenings look like, um, how they would be structured, and what opportunities for discussion that we can provide to these partnerships. Just leave it at that and see if anyone has any questions. Uh, Liza Jane. Quick comment, Courtney. Uh, this is Liza Jane. I heard from people that attended that, actually called on their way home to say they were thrilled. It was really valuable and good, so good job. Thank you very much for that feedback. Thanks, Courtney. Eric on technical assistance rulemaking update. Good morning, Mr. Co-Chairs, members of the board. For the record, Eric Hartstein, Senior Policy Coordinator. Uh, on item P3, the technical assistance rules update, um, OWEB currently does not have any technical assistance rules. We're operating under the Division 5, which is the broad grant program uh, administrative rules for our TA grants. And at the July 2017 meeting, the board authorized rulemaking for TA grants. And um, over the winter, we established a rules advisory committee, or a RAC, to help staff vet ideas that would be incorporated into the technical assistance rules. And attachment A um, has the list of who is on that RAC. Um, over the winter and early spring, the RAC met on two occasions, one in person and one via teleconference. Um, the first meeting was to discuss some of the broad themes and concepts to include in the technical assistance rules. And the second teleconference meeting was to provide feedback on a draft version of the rules that we had put together for them. So the draft rules include um, three technical assistance grant categories, um, technical design and engineering. These are the um, grants that go to um, engineering or designs for, say, a, a dam removal where an applicant is looking to um, get different versions of designs to look at um, yeah, removing a, a dam or another type of project where design work is, is needed. Resource assessment and planning. This could be um, gathering information at an entire watershed level or down at, the, at a reach level in a stream um, that would then go towards um, 
actions that um, either restore or protect um, native fish and wildlife habitats or uh, water quality. And the last is organizational technical assistance. And these are um, similar to what you approved yesterday on the organizational collaboration grant, um, where groups of um, partners are collaborating to, to get at those same outcomes on a little bit different time horizon. So um, the Department of Justice has reviewed draft rules. Um, we just got some feedback um, earlier this week on that. And we intend to put out a draft for public comment during the month of May, and then bring the um, draft to the board for your consideration at the June meeting. So with that, I'll take any questions. Questions for Eric from the board? Thank you. I guess uh, you're not going to take us through your, your livestock report. It's just for general information. Yeah. OK. Yeah, so um, for the record, Maida Lofts Garden, uh, item P4 is uh, a director's update for your information. So please take a look at the Livestock Exclusion Monitoring Study Report and let um, Ken Fetcho know if you have any questions. None. We're, we're ready. Well, uh, Will probably has to weigh in here too, and um, I just want to say that it was really a memorable evening last night and we and this morning. And we owe so much thanks to the staff for this meeting. A fat board book does correlate with extra work, <laughs> we find. And it's just neat that all the board got here to, to, to a great degree. And, and it's fun to see our new board members finding their legs and contributing substantively, and it's an historic time to have Bruce and, and Paul join us, and welcome again. I told uh, Bruce that um, he should convey to Bob Weber that we learned this weekend that, in fact, he was not irreplaceable, <laughs> and, but, but we miss him. Uh, and Paul, it's neat that, that um, it's fun to be here when the Fish and Wildlife Service is finally recognized properly and can provide input to our work. Yeah. Will Neuhauser, for the record, I would echo what uh, Randy said, but <laughs> especially like to thank and make sure that we our thanks extended to Roaring Springs for the enormous amount of time they devoted to giving us two tours, uh, in particular the one at 4 o'clock in the morning. So uh, great to be out in this part of the world again. So we're adjourned. Well, we got a long ways to go. <laughs> oh, um, there is uh, food that can be packaged up to go um, at the back here um, for folks. I think, right, Derek? I can okay. Yeah, hey. How you doing? I recognize you. Yeah, how are you? Although, you know, I think last time I started. Nice job. That was a great meeting on the weekend. I mean, the whole thing. It was the I'm with you. It was really good. And this, I was just talking to Sue Patty. This um, conversation the, was exactly, exactly the right level. No, these trips we take, these tours, um, it's, it's, it's.